But I am getting excited once I get the windshield on, and then I'm going to start focusing in on starting up the engine. It hasn't been started since the rebuild yet. So, but I've told myself I'm not going to fire up the engine until I can drive it out of the garage onto the road. That's an exciting moment, I know. Yeah, been two oh, years yeah. now. Ah, uh, the man must be coming. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying. I'm, I'm fiddling around with all the stuff that I got to fiddle with as the host. So, but apparently everybody can come on anyway um, without me being there. So that's a deal. Yeah, we learned last week that if we post uh, stuff in the chat section before you come on, you don't see it. That's oh, why. Oh, okay. Week. Well, there's probably a way to fix that, you know, but anyway, um, I'm just trying to find the chat section right now. Here we go, chat. That's what I need to know. I always have a, a list of people who are on, but um, so I got nothing in the chat section right now. So, so this is a, a note to everybody to... to uh, so we've got 36 people on. Oh, here's something already. Yep, from Tracy Macover, Makovec. Yep, <laughs> I'm not sure I've seen his name before. So anyway, yep, we got lots of lots of cool stuff to talk about tonight when that time comes. So we'll wait for wait for the numbers to 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 uh, swell up here a little bit. I talked to, or I didn't talk, I corresponded with Norm Ewing from South Africa. And he's, uh, he often can't come on because, well, he's 80. So by the time he's got to stay up until one o'clock in the morning or something, and sometimes that doesn't happen. Or there's what they call power shedding, where they shut their power off. I don't get why you shut the power off at night. I get why you shut it off during the day, because that's when most of the was most most of the demand is. But anyway, I don't get that. But right now, his wife has his computer in. Um, and Guido says he can't get into the meeting because he hasn't got the right passcode. It's just twist. So anyway, I think passcode is just twist. Is a capital T, right? Capital T twist. Yes. Yeah. I wonder if he chose the wrong pass ID number. Well, it's the same. I use my same, you know, they, they ask you every time when I set these up, it's like, is this a unique one or do I use my normal, um, my normal Zoom meeting room, I don't know what they call it exactly. I always use my normal Zoom meeting room. Why change it up? The only time I got in trouble for that was when, when we got Zoom bombed. Uh, and that's almost two years ago now. That, that was fun. And in fact, it was Guido's wife who, um, who he called me right after I, because I had to shut the whole thing down as offensive. <laughs> and he said, just start right back up again. And I did. And almost, uh, I don't have, at least half the people who were on came back on just logged back in again and wh whatever robot was was uh had zoom bombed us had left so that you know that was the only time that that, that happened we got 69 people on and it's seven o'clock so we're going to start up because that's what time we start so welcome to i don't know the 38th the the 83rd i don't know zoom session i haven't got them numbered i suppose i should if I looked on, on YouTube, I think I've got everything up with the last one. Um, anyway, if I took a look, I'd, I'd have a clue how many, how many Zooms we've done so far. So if you're new, let me explain just a little bit about how this works. I go through, you have to listen to me drone on for 15 minutes or so, 20 minutes, and then we open it up to chat. So if you want to put something in the chat section, go to your bottom ribbon, find the chat, pose a question over in the chat section, I'll call on you and we can get to it. If you have something to comment on when we're doing the chat, just break in. 
and um, and and say something and and um, um, and we'll accept your accept your comments. Um, I've got a real powerful button here, a mute all button. I just I just used it, and that mutes everybody that that comes on here. I just got a note probably back from Guido. Um, and uh, just a second here. Um, anyway, I've got this powerful mute all button and I use it because always there's a dog or I don't know, dishes or a, a grandchild trying to help their grandpa get on or there's something in the background. So I just hit that and it isn't because I don't like it, but we want to have silence in, in the background as, as best we can. So I use that mute all button. Now to unmute yourself when you when either I call on you or you've got something to say, there's two ways to do that. One is to go to the, on my computer at least, you go to the bottom ribbon and there are um, um, a series of things on there you can do, but one of them has to, and one of them says, what, uh, mute. You can click that with your mouse or your, your uh, um, finger pad. Or more easily, while you're speaking, you can simply hold the space bar down while you're speaking. And when you're done, you let up on it and that unmutes you. Someone alerted us to that. I don't know, it must have been a dozen, dozen Zooms ago or so. So that's a pretty handy way of doing it. Uh, what else? That's about it, you know. Uh, I make my pitch a couple of times during the, during the presentation to, to please visit my website. My website is getting better. Um, I haven't looked at it yet to see what changes are going on, but I know there's changes going on. Marty's doing some some my uh, uh, administrative assistant is starting to work with the website, so we're we're going to refresh it because like there's events from 2018 on there and stuff like that. So we're refreshing it, and I'm hoping to get a lot more technical information on there um, as well as uh, questions and answers that I answer off email. And a comment about the email, you can send me an email, you can send me a question, but gosh, I wish I could, but I don't answer all of them, I don't. And it, if you've sent me an email and you haven't gotten an answer, you know that's, that's the truth. But if you call me, then that embarrasses me enough that I will answer your email after we talk about it. If I can't answer it on the phone, then I can answer it by email. And those emails are in turn, printed in a variety of locations. Where's the, uh, oh gosh, I just had it in my hand. The, uh, the, the North American MGB registers uh, newsletter. We just, we just got that, where is that? Um, here it is. So here's the MGB driver. If you're not, if you're an MGB owner, you should be a member of the North American MGB register. And you get this, this um, uh, small sized newsletter uh, bi bi monthly. And in the back, there's technical. Guess who writes most of that? Yours truly. So, anyway, this is a good organization to belong to. If you're an MGA owner, it's NAMGAR. If you're a T type owner, it's the New England MGT register. If you own a midget, it's the B register. Again, if you're a C owner, you've got your choice of two different organizations. One is the MGB register, um, and the other one is the, um, is the American MGC Register Association, AMCRA. So anyway, lots of different clubs that you can belong to. But when you go to my website um, to um, take a look at this or that, please visit the PayPal button on the right-hand side of the, of the uh, opening page. And it says something cute like help John afford his retirement. And it's, it's, um, um, it, it does work. It does work because uh, I, I do get, I do get uh, um, stuff on there. And I thank everyone. I try to thank everyone uh, in person on these Zoom sessions. And I, I keep, I'm still working backwards uh, to thank the people via email who have contributed because I do appreciate it very much. There are costs associated with doing this. I pay um, constant contact. I pay Zoom. I pay insurance. Go figure. Um, 
And um, anyway, and then and then there's always something left over for me. So I printed them off tonight. I print them off each Zoom session. I want to thank the people who have contributed. Uh, there are regular contributors in that they have a recurring payment. I've got that with um, um, Wikipedia. You know, all these places exist through through donations. So as I do. So anyway, thank you very much to John Uhas, David Drenning, Quentin Reeder, Greg Fisher, Barry Spear, Kurt Johnson, James Simino, Alan Batchelder, Louis Bala, Mark McCann, John DeCarly, Henry Morgan, Roberta Johnson, heard you when I came on talking about your, your engine. Mark Goldfarb, David Smittle, Jonathan Grabhoff, John Caldwell, David Bond, uh, Peter Price, uh, Tom Starkweather. Those are the names since last time. So thank you very, very much. So again, if you go on my website, University Motors LTD, dot com uh, you'll see that yellow paypal button there and i do i do sincerely appreciate the the donations that are made some of them are real small some of them are surprisingly large um, anyway thanks to 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 all who think of me in a, a moment of weakness i don't know and and uh, and make a contribution so tonight oh then there's another thing too and that is i took a look at youtube because i haven't done that for a couple of sessions. And I thought, you know, it's the end of the summer. Well, I'm going to be getting really close to my personal goal. And so as of tonight, when I took a look at it, it's probably a couple more now, there are 9,954,499 views. So I only need 40, um, 45,000 more people, and I'll hit my 10 million mark. So maybe by the next Zoom or the Zoom after that. Of course, if I made some Zooms and put those up, then, then that would all get more exciting and people would look at more of them. But um, anyway, thank you. Thank you for taking a look at them because I get paid by Google for every one of those Zooms. I don't think it's very much. I don't know. It's a, I don't think it's a, it's not a, it's not a penny per, per view, um, but it's something per view and, and anything anything times 10 million is, is something. So thanks very much. I want to talk tonight only comments about static timing, static timing in your car. Oh, no, wait. First of all, I just saw uh, Jim Pastor. So here's the, here's the uh, event, um, the Central Pennsylvania British Car um, Fest, and that's coming up next weekend. I'm going to drive out to Altoona on, on Wednesday. Jim, do you still have a spot open at the at the seminar, tech seminar? Yes, we had somebody canceled, so yes, we have one. Okay, all right. So the deal is that uh, you can follow the link in that constant contact, and if you want to come to the tech seminar, which is front suspension mostly, at Jim's house, uh, he's got a really really nice garage. What's that? Forty by sixty, your shop. Really nice carpet on the floor, lots of nice people, some triumph people. But um, anyway, lots of lots of nice people. We're going to do some front suspension work. It's always nice to commune with with uh, other people. And it's a precursor to this, the um, the Central Pennsylvania British Car Fest. Jim, how many people do you have signed up for that? Is It was more than last year. Yeah, yeah, it, we consider it another rebuilding year. We're we're at 120 for dinner on Saturday night, and 150, 160 chicken dinners on Sunday, and 85 cars pre-registered. Great, great. Is that is that back up at, at the at the spaghetti place? No, they're still not doing any car shows there. Okay, um, but we're we're back at the same place at Lakemont at the park. Okay, all right. Okay. On Sunday. Got it. Got it. 
Okay, so anyway, so there's there's that, that event coming up. And then uh, the next event that I'll be at will, will be the Toronto MG Car Club meeting on around the 13th or so, Tuesday the 13th of, of um, September. And then uh, I got some noise here. I got to find out how I can, uh, come on. Um, Anyway, the uh, Tuesday, the 13th of September, I'm going to be up in Toronto, and then I'll be at the Hunt Country Classic um, in um, Virginia. Um, mute all. There we go. Get rid of the background noise. Thank you. At the Hunt Country Classic in um, um, Marshall, Virginia, which is just outside Washington, D.C., and that is, on, I don't have my calendar here. I think it's the 9th, Sunday, the 9th of October. Correct. So, oh, Ruth. I, I just yep. saw you, your name flash up up here. So you, you probably know Ruth Arnold. It, it is the 9th. Okay. Um, 9th of October. And it's, a, and it's it, just outside, outside Middleburg, Marshall. Okay. It's, it's a great a, it's, show. So everybody we're putting a lot of work into it so we expect a lot of response <laughs> i've been there twice when it's rained not rain no, it's but going to be, been it's misty going to be beautiful. um it's supposed to be, to be supposed to be really nice it's a british car event so there are triumphs and heelys and sunbeams and rileys and wolseleys and bentleys and rolls royce and mini mokes and so the whole, the whole, I don't, I didn't see a bond last year, but uh, there's just a whole host of host. Of, and maybe, maybe there'll be a Marina. I see skip. On, so maybe there'll be a Marina there, but then maybe not. They're pretty rare. Maybe anyway. the British will be there and there will be treats for dogs. Treats for dogs. And very often they have a representative of the British government. Um, and we're hoping year, to get the uh, hoping the ambassador will come, um, but we're hoping at least someone will come, and uh, so it will be a good day. Excellent. Last year, the um, the, the ambassador the ambassador didn't make it, but they sent Air Vice Marshal someone who was um, yes, I was properly outfitted. He was he was a great guy. So I heard, unfortunately, I had to go to a funeral, so I couldn't go last year, but I understand he was great. So maybe he'll come again. Okay. We'll see. Thanks. Thank you. So those are the two events I'm going to, and I know there's just, there's an event a weekend from now until, I don't know, Christmas, you know, and then it starts up again. Anyway, I want to, I want to talk about static timing. Um, static timing is, is one of two ways to time your car. One is, is static, which means the engine is not running. And the other one is dynamic timing with a strobe light. So there are two, two acceptable ways of timing the car. My suggestion is when you're doing strobe timing to set to set the engine at 32 degrees before top dead center at full mechanical advance, vacuum disconnected, which means up at three or 4,000 RPM, it's really screaming. The problem is there aren't enough timing marks. So it's easier to use a dial back timing light or else you've got to make different marks on your front cover or on your front pulley. But a dial back timing light gets you there. That's all of our cars not twin cams and not MGB GT V8s, but all the rest of our cars from a TC through a 1980 MGB, it's 32 degrees at full mechanical advance. So that's when the, when the timing stops moving when you're, when you're slowly accelerating the car. But let's say that you just wanna get it going. Um, you can only use static when you have points, it's very difficult to, use, to do that same technique when you've got electronic ignition. And you can take a look at your distributor specifications 
to see what the distributor advance is to figure out what your timing should be. Now, nominally, you can set your car at zero, zero or 10 degrees before, somewhere in there, and static time it and it'll start up, it'll run, but it won't run as well as it might unless you get the correct timing. On the MGB, for instance, there's one distributor from 1962 through 1967. And then that same distributor continues on the home models all the way through 1980. They didn't have to worry about emissions. But beginning in 1968, and with a change almost every year after that, the distributor changes so that the car pollutes correctly instead of runs correctly. So I just wanna show this earlier distributor and I don't have a good, I don't have a good um, camera. So this is, I've plotted, I gotta stand up so I can see. I've plotted every, every distributor. This is the, the 40897. I've plotted every MG distributor and you can, there's the curve. It's, there's no curve in it at all. It's, it's a couple of uh, intersecting um, linear changes in the timing. But this one, the 40897, maxes out at 10 degrees before top, the top dead center. It maxes out at, at 10 degrees. Well, those are distributor degrees. So you've got to double them to get crankshaft degrees. So in this 40897 distributor, um, since you've got 20 degrees on the crank, you subtract that from the 32, and that gives you your static timing, which is 12 degrees before top dead center. So in the case of, of this distributor in your engine, and there are a variety of, of I mean, a, a marina uses a different distributor, a midget uses a different distributor, a different total advance, distributors. Um, a 1974 MGB uses an 18 degree distributor, which doubled is 36 degrees, which means that you've got to set the static time at negative four degrees, because 36 minus four equals 32. So you roll the engine around until you find your static timing setting whatever that might be. If you're not sure, you can look at the distributor, you can take the, the plate off the top of the distributor that's got the points in it, look down inside, there's a cam, that cam is stamped with a number. It might be 10, 12, in the case of an MGA, it might be 14, it might be 16, it might be 19, who knows what it might be, but you can get the real number off your distributor. Because who knows that the distributor in your car is the one that's supposed to be in there. So you have to look at the, at the total advance to see what it is. So once you've got that number, say a 40897 with a 10 degree, um, cam in, on, on the inside of it, you double that, you get 20, 20 from 32 equals 12 degrees. So you roll the engine around to 12 degrees before top dead center. And you take your 12 volt test light. This is the easier way to do it is the way I'm telling you. And disconnect the low tension lead from the distributor. Put the test light between the distributor and something hot, most easily your fuse box. If the points are closed, the test light will be on. When the points are open, the test light will be off. So you hold the distributor, the, the, the um, rotor arm, you hold that clockwise to make sure that the automatic advance, the mechanical advance is all the way off. And you rotate the distributor clockwise until the light just goes out lock it down there and that's your static timing. So again, that's a test light between the distributor and something hot. Hold the rotor arm clockwise, turn the distributor clockwise until the light just goes out and that's it's static timed and the car will start up. Easy as that. This 
this is detailed in, uh, I, just, I was just taking a look in the MGA workshop manual. There is section B7, I think static timing that goes on for quite some time. And it can be, there's some stuff in there that can be confusing, but just offhand, this is the way that I do it. It's, it's, it's really fast, it's real easy. And it will give you the total advance of 32 degrees that, that is correct. But look at this book. Those are all MG distributors. Those are all the MG distributors. Pages and pages of them. We extracted all, all the information out of, um, out of the workshop manuals and out of all the special tuning information. And anyway, someday, someday, maybe I'll take all that and put it in a nice handy dandy little book. So in the meantime, if you've got a question about your distributor, you can always call me. I'm always happy to answer it. And, um, and I, I can either send, I can even send you the advanced spec um, page out of my book now that I've retrieved it from the basement and have it up in my office. So we'll start off and see if anyone's got some questions about static timing. And, and then we'll get into our chat section. So. If you get a question about static timing, just unmute yourself and go for it. Hey, John, this is Cliff Beckman. Yes, sir. Uh, <clears throat> my 68 MGB, I rotate the crankshaft pulley and I get about a three or four degree rotation of the pulley before the crankshaft turns. So thank you. So you always turn the crankshaft pulley clockwise because that's dragging the cam behind it the that three or four degrees is the slack and the can and the chain on the right hand side of the chain if you take if you took the timing cover off and looked at it the the um, um there's some slack in the chain and then when you rotate it the other way the left hand side of the chain will go tight so it's just the just that it's just the wear in the chain so Thank you very much. You always turn the, the, the pulley clockwise. And then um, if you go beyond the mark, back it up five, 10 degrees and come at it again. Okay, good. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Any more questions about static timing? Yeah, I've got one. Yeah, John. Oh, it's okay. go ahead. Well, I, I don't know who I've got up, up on the screen right now. I'm Eric. Uh, okay. If, uh, I've got a 71. First of all, thanks a lot for doing these uh, okay. sessions. Um, I've got a 71 midget and I static timed it for the first time just a couple of months ago. You know, it ran well and I'd messed around with that dial, just seeing how the timing made the car feel. But I just did seven and a half before top dead center, you know, on the flywheel mark and static timed it to that. Is that correct? That's real close. Okay. That's real close. I mean, if I look, if I look in my book, if I look in my book under a midget, 71 midget, now this only assumes 1971, 71 midget has got a 41, 271 distributor, a 41, 271. I'll look back here, 41271, just a minute. 412, 41, come on, baby. I know I got it here. 41, 41. Ah, I don't have it. How can I not have it? I just said I had all of them, but <laughs> I got a 41284 which is a magnet of all things. And I got a 41270, um, which is 67 to 74 midget. Um, and that has a total advance of 11 degrees, a double 11, you get 22. Okay. So your proper timing should be around 10. Around 10, all right, thank you. Yeah. Somebody else came in just as you did and uh, yeah, yeah, John, it was, it's uh, Rudy, but it says Dora on my computer. Yeah, okay. 
So I, I just got one of the new uh, distributors from Moss and it's an electronic one. Okay, so it says that I should have ported vacuum. How does one go about doing that? What kind of just what kind of carburetor do you have? I have the dual SUs. Are they 58 MGA? Okay, well, the MGA, the MGAs have a vacuum port. Um, it's not manifold vacuum thereafter, it's ported vacuum. So on the on the on the rear, uh, just in front of the mounting flange on the MGA. Um, rear carburetor is a fitting which sits which has got a hole drilled right up to the to the butterfly okay i'm familiar with that and that's that's where you'd hook it in oh so that's okay so that's plenty i didn't know if i needed to go somewhere else and get a nope. stronger vacuum or not that's it it just it seems like such a, a little almost a weep hole i just wanted to make sure yeah, but you can you can get a lot of vacuum through a, a weep hole. I mean, you you know, I mean, you, if you if, if you've got a mighty vac, that's a little tiny tiny yeah. tube too. You can draw, you know, you, you can draw twenty eight inches of of uh, mercury with with one of those. So that's yeah, a good point. And and a, just an extension, not to do with that, but how old is gas? Okay, so the car was sitting for a year and a half, two years. Do I just pull the drain plug and get rid of all of that? Usually you don't have to. Sometimes it, de it depends on whether you can start it or not. If you, can, if you can start it, you're home free. Oh, okay. If you can't start it, then sometimes you can take the air cleaners off and you can start it with some carb cleaner and then it'll get running. And then as long as it stays running, you can drive it down to the, down to the uh, gas station and put in some 93 oh, okay. or 91, and that'll mix with the old gas and, and bring it up. But you, want, you don't want to do any, any real heavy duty tuning until you burn that old gas out, out of there. Okay. Sometimes old gas gets so bad, it just isn't volatile at, 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 um, at low speeds. I mean, when you're cranking the engine, rah, 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 I mean, hardly any air is going through the carburetor at all. And the function of the carburetor is to evaporate the gasoline. So there, there aren't any lightweight components of the gasoline left. They've already boiled away, so it doesn't vaporize correctly. But if you can get it to run and speed up the air going through the, the carburetor, then that old gasoline works just fine. Um, um, okay. See, I'm, I'm, a, I'm one of the luckier ones. It's a California car, and uh, I can loosen up any old nut or bolt and it still comes loose. And so I tried the drain plug on the gas tank just today and it backed right off. And I know that thing's never been off. Never. So, but if you drain it, then the question is, what do you do with the gasoline? I, and, I, and I didn't drain it. I just, uh, yeah. I knew we were gonna have the meeting and I wanted to see if it would come loose. It dripped a little bit. I, locked, I closed it back up. And, uh, and you're right, I didn't know what I would do with the gas. I figured maybe if I did have to take it out, I could do it in one of those reclamation places where you sure. take your old paint and stuff like that. Sure. All right, appreciate it, John. Okay, you. you're welcome. You're welcome. Do we have any more questions about, about timing, static timing, any kind of timing? Uh, yeah, this... I think I heard Crystal in there. Well, yeah. Yeah, John, uh, I had my engine rebuilt. It's an 18, yep. it's an 18 V, right? I also had the distributor rebuilt. Okay. Uh, so both of those are ready. I put the distributor in. Okay. And when I go to do the static timing, is there anything? No, words. when I put the distributor in, I just put in however it would fit down in the hole and tighten it down. Is there anything else I need to check, like uh, you know, piston orientation, or just go for the twelve degrees on the uh, uh... Roll, roll it around? You're, you're fortunately your timing marks are up at eleven o'clock, so you can like actually see them. You don't have to crawl down, <laughs> crawl down on your stomach and look at them upside down. So you know each one of those each one of those marks in a in a, a clockwise direction um, is. Uh, um, 
five degrees. So you're gonna you're gonna find um, if it this is a, a this is the correct distributor for a, for seventy three. So what year? Uh, I've got a seventy MGB, and yes, he uh, took the distributor and he tuned that to match my car and match the engine eighteen V. Okay. Right? So I would start, I, I'd use a strobe timing on that eventually, but um, but start it around 10 degrees and you should be just fine there. Okay, so so roll it around to 10 degrees before top dead center and then, and then uh, loosen up the distributor, put a test light between the distributor and hot and, and hold the rotor clockwise and turn the distributor clockwise until the light just goes out and reclamp it, and then wherever, uh, and then wherever the rotor's pointed, uh, that wire should go to the distributor or to the uh, cylinder that's firing. So, because top dead center comes up twice, it comes up um, when you're firing on number one, and then it, you get around 360 degrees, and now it's firing on number four. Then you come back around 360 more degrees and it's firing on number one again. So you got to make sure which cylinder you're firing on. And that's a function of where the distributor drive gear is. So not normally the number one um, wire leaves the cap around one or two o'clock. But when the engine has been rebuilt, you just don't know where the rebuilder put the distributor drive gear. So you've got to figure out which, which cylinder is firing when you're at top dead center. The easiest way is to take the valve cover off and feel the rockers, feel the rockers. And whichever cylinder is firing, one or four, those rockers are loose. In, the, in the, the opposite one, four or one, the rockers are tight because they're, they're moving the valves. So you roll around to top dead center, Feel the feel which which rockers are loose. Let's say it's number four, for instance, and and uh, then go ahead and time it, you know, um, with a test light, and then make sure that the rotor, the wire coming from that rotor goes to four, and from that is uh, and is counterclockwise, anticlockwise, uh, two, one, three, four, two. Um, in the, in the proper firing order, one, three, four, two. If you got a okay. question, call me. Okay, that makes a lot of sense now. Thank you. You're welcome. So John, this is Dave in uh, Omaha about yes. static versus dynamic. Yes. And I think, you know, I, boy, I tell you, I was struggling between them. It seems like static would be a good way to time the engine if it hasn't been run or it's been rebuilt by dynamic would be the way to go to really get your car running optimally and to consider the condition of the distributor. Would you say that, that's about a, the right way to look at this? That is absolutely correct because timing is critical. And I mean, there are all kinds of things can happen. You can have a distributor that's frozen up, has no advance, it doesn't advance at all. Um, so if, if you set it at um, uh, set it static, um, then it ain't going to run at high speed because it, it can't it can't advance far enough. I mean, there's all kinds of things that can happen, but um, or it can be sticky and not and not really work very well. But the the critical part of the timing, I've said this before, some of these other Zoom sessions. Uh, Carl Heidemann and I had a tuning for speed class, oh my gosh, 15 years ago. A fella drove out from Hershey, Pennsylvania in a 67B. We spent all day to tune it because the first thing you do for tuning for speed is tune up your existing car without starting to add any more uh, go fast parts on it. Just make the car run as well as it possibly can run in its present configuration. We checked the timing and found that it was 27 before top dead center. I went through a whole tune up moved it to 32. The next day we went to the dynamometer, put it on the dyno. We got 62 horsepower at the rear wheels. Um, you go, is that all? Yeah, that's all, that's real good. <laughs> that's really good for a B, um, for a, a normal B. 
and uh, we got 62 horsepower. So we moved the timing back to 27. We lost five horsepower. So timing is critical. Some people say, oh, I just put it in and turn it until it runs the best. Well, it runs the best at idle, but you don't care how well it runs at idle. You want it to run the best at high speed when you're asking the engine to produce as much energy as it possibly can. So timing is critical. And the only way to make sure that's correct is to strobe timing. But since none of our cars have got, have got enough timing marks, um, you've, got to, uh, you've got to use a dial back to get to, get to um, 32 degrees, especially the earlier cars with the timing marks down on, on the bottom, the three or four marks on the bottom. There is a trick you can use on the 18V engines with just a regular strobe light making a new mark on the pulley so that you can still get to 32, but that strobe is the most important. It takes in account all the wear and the distributor and, and uh, it's just, it's the best way to go. That's strobe timing. Hey, John. Hey, Guido, you got on. I got on, only, only took me 12 times. I don't know why. You were misspelling I mean, twist. You were misspelling uh, twist, huh? Yeah. <laughs> No, I mean, I, I, I've been on this on your uh, Zoom a ma million times, and um, it took 12 times to hit enter, 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 and it finally went. I don't know what's so anyway. So, listen, so you told me back in the day, you remember, I sent my um, distributor out, and then you helped me set it up by static. Um, the car is running fantastic, okay. I went out the other day. It was probably 80 degrees here in South Jersey. Cars running beautiful. Then when it starts getting up like 90 and we've had some 100 degree days, I come to like a stop sign, it starts to fumble a little bit. And I, I gotta like give it gas to try to, so it don't stall, you know? Somebody said, pull the choke out a little. Um, I mean, I know these cars don't like hot weather or, or, or am I wrong? <laughs> the problem is the problem is the gasoline, modern gasoline with alcohol, which is what everybody gets unless unless you hunt for a station with non-alcohol, non-alcohol gasoline, or sometimes when you buy high test like 91, 92, that doesn't have um, alcohol in it. It actually boils. It boils at the te at under bonnet temperatures, and so once it starts boiling, then then the carburetor's ability to um, <coughs> meter the amount of air fuel mixture you, you just you lose you lose that. A modern should cars, I not be using? Should I not be using? I, I, I use I'm using high tests ninety one. Well, which you want to try to find non gasoline with no alcohol in it. And you can go on your phone. Uh, I think there's an app hey, on, on your phone that says Pure Gas. Oh, yeah. Puregas.org. Hey, John. You can do it on your phone. You can do it on your computer. Puregas.org. I had the exact problem last year until I started using non ethanol. The problem went away. Runs great. No kidding. Hey, John. Yeah, Bill Waterstrad. He's a, he sells. He knows everything about modern cars. What? To, not Toyotas. What? What do you? That's embarrassing. I I I retired from Honda. So Honda, Honda. All right. Okay. It's, it's over with. Hey, uh, if you live near a um, uh, area that has a lot of lakes and a lot of water uh, craft, the gas stations sell non-alcohol uh, fuel for the watercraft because the watercraft act the same way with the alcohol and the fuel. It, it deteriorates the inside of the fuel system. But you can buy it there at the pump. Uh, it's about a dollar more a gallon. I just experienced it last week when I was on vacation. But again, it's got to be an area that has a lot of lakes and water sports and stuff like that. Okay. Is it is there an octane that you have to get? I don't remember. You know what? I didn't check the octane when I was looking at it, but it just said no alcohol no in the alcohol. fuel. Yeah. Most of our car, most of our cars run just fine on 87. You know, I, I tell people use 89 all the time. I've got, I run an MGA with a high compression. I run 90, uh, I run high test, but, but 
to get rid of this boiling problem that you're experiencing, um, you want you want to find non-alcoholic gasoline. Can you, get it, a, can you get it at an airport? Uh, not legally. <laughs> Like a local little local uh, airport. Well, no? you you can you can use yes yes if they, if they if they've got non-alcohol gasoline you can, but remember that when you're buying it from the um uh, from the um uh, from the marina or from the airport, theoretically you're not you're not paying road tax, so mm -hmm. depends on whether there's a policeman pulled up behind you or not. Okay, so non non-alcoholic.com, is that what you said? Uh, pure gas. Pure gas. Not pure alcohol. gas. <laughs> if you're in Jersey, New Jersey, you'll have it at a Wawa. Ethanol free Wawa's up in New really? Jersey. Really? Yep. I get it. Wawa's here in Florida. Yeah. I run my all three of mine, the T D and the MTA and the MTB on 87 non-ethanol. Uh it, yeah, uh, maybe I should dial back the timing a little bit so it doesn't ping, but I never hear it ping. And um, I, I have very little of the issue you're talking about. And South Carolina's got high temperatures. So yeah. 87 seems to work. I mean, it runs fantastic. As soon as like we went out yesterday, we, went, we cruised, it was running beautiful, stopping at red lights, stop signs, nothing. As soon as the temperature starts going up to the 90s, it starts to fumble. Well, it's, it's, it's even worse when you stop at the party store to buy alcoholic beverages and you're in there for, for seven minutes and you come out and the car's been off and the underbonnet temperature has just exploded. It's gone up to, you know, even goes higher. It's just, it won't, it won't start. It will not start until you open the open the bonnet, let the thing ventilate for a while, and then of course you got to suffer the indignity of people walking by and going, "Hey, cool car, what's the matter with it?" So, anyway, <laughs> been there, okay. been there. Hey, John. Yes. So, is I think that's called uh, vapor lock in a in a vehicle, right? Whenever that happens. Um, vape, vapor lock is it, it is is. It's the same idea. It's the same yeah. idea. Vapor lock is, in fact, um, when the gasoline boils before the the fuel pump, um, oh, and then the fuel nice. pump can't move um, gas. It can move liquid, but it can't move gas. So, gotcha. so in uh, Ohio or Pennsylvania, it's called no e gas, and it's typically ninety one. It's ninety one octane. Okay. The other things in uh, changing your timing around uh, telltales that might be that you might be too far advanced would be pinging, although I've yes. never heard. Or if you go to shut the car off and it and it, what's that called whenever it runs Dieseling. on? Dieseling. Dieseling. Yeah. Um, so Dieseling. Um, you may be too far advanced. So the, uh, the the last thing, and I'll get off of here. But the last thing I wanted to ask you was if you'd ever been to this uh, Pure gas. Uh, Hook and Bay reunion on uh, the, on uh, South Bass Island in uh, Lake Erie. No, no. So that's like a, a vintage sports car race. It's going to be uh, the 18th of September. The race is actually on the Wednesday of that week, but. Uh, I was just, it was one of the reasons I got on. I wanted to see if you were uh, going to be attending that or not, but it sounds like you have other plans already. But, but the, uh, the mark, the mark that they're racing this year are MGs and Triumphs. Well, very cool. Yep. That's Putin Bay. Yes. Okay. Yep. It's called the uh, PIB, PIB reunion is if you wanted to Google it. Okay. Thank you. Any more comments about timing? And then we'll get into our chat. Yeah, John, I got one other question. It's Rudy again. Um, you talked about a dial back timing light and I'm sorry, I do not know what that product okay. is. So normally on a, on a timing light, I mean, help me out, the, the, the spark, the light flashes when the spark comes. That's a normal timing light but you can get a, a dial on the back or a push button on the back that changes when the light comes. 
and okay. the, the light comes before the spark. So I asked my my Snap-on tool dealer. I said, "Well, how does it how does it know the spark the the, the spark's going to come? I mean, could you hook it right. up to the to the you know to the Wall Street Journal and figure out what the stocks are going to be tomorrow?" No. Nice. Anyway, anyway it obviously times it off the last spark, but it's it's called a dial back timing light. They're they're not real common. Uh, when you go in the auto parts store, there'll be a lot of dust on the on the package. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because as you were talking about it, I tried to find it on Amazon and I can't find one. Interesting. I, I bet Harbor Freight has them. You know, if you're not going to use it a lot, Harbor Freight has them for thirty bucks. Uh, I 30. got. I hope, I hope like heck I'm not going to use it a lot. <laughs> thirty. Oh my gosh, that's that's not enough. The last one I bought from Napa was like a hundred, but then it, that failed too. So it, you know they don't make them like they used to. And my like I said, if you're going to use it once, <laughs> my snap on one only works when I'm looking up. So I, I can use it on an MGA or an early B or a midget looking up. But as soon as I turn it horizontal or down, there's some connection in it that gets lost and it won't flash. Frustrating. Hey, hey guys, Rich. Uh, thank you, Rich. I yes, I have one from Amazon. And it is an Innova I N N O V A fifty five sixty eight. It's pretty good. Um, there's one feature that you cannot use with a positive ground system. Um, I forget what it is, but it's not that critical. I mean, you can time it just fine. Just reverse the leads if you have a positive ground. It works great. It's one hundred twelve dollars. Great. There's a there's another one Innova three five 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 advanced timing light that's forty seven forty eight dollars. Um, that has a dial on the back. Cool. Thank the old, you. Uh, the old Sears Craftsman's uh, worked really well as well. If you can and find some it. of them have a tack on them, which is kind of handy, except that they're digital and it's like watching the gas pump as it rolls back, back and forth, you know, but some of them got a tack on them, which is kind of handy. You can use it to, to calibrate your tack in your own car. So thanks, Fred. So John, I have a question. I have a uh, this is Skip Cherokee's in Seattle, and I've got a 63B. So I've got the lookup problem with the uh, timing marks. Can I take a later model cover and put it on my car? And do I have to change the pulley, or yes. does everything just fit? Yes, yes, because it, the, there's a pulley. There's a pulley that goes with the mark. Six o'clock marks. And there's a pulley that goes with the 11 o'clock marks. Okay. You can't mix them up. Okay. Um, but that is the cool setup. Oh my gosh. So you change your cover, depending on which cover you've got, but change it with the timing marks up above and then get a harmonic balancer, which is a whole lot better for the engine than the steel pulley that you probably already have. Um, and you can buy, and I think the, the new pulleys that Moss sells are marked both at six and 11. So they don't have to have two of them in, oh, cool. in, in, in a bin next to each other. So they're, they're marked in, in both places. Oh, that's good. Thank you, John. Yeah, they are uh, marked like that, Moss police. Okay. Yeah, that's a real, that's a real good, um, real good, real good upgrade to make. I've got that on my MGA. So that, that you know, so I, I'll lose points in the, uh, in the originality contest, but I don't care. <laughs> it's like an, are they, I can time it from above. Are the Moss pulleys balancers or just pulleys? Balancers, harmonic balancers. Do if you have, have an old harmonic balancer, uh, you can use that. Uh, you can you can send your harmonic balancer if it's shot, if the rubber's kind of crappy in it or it's moved. So the problem with real old harmonic balancers is there's an inside and an outside and they're separated with um, uh, rubber. And sometimes the outside moves and you, you know, you're trying to time it and you go, this, this just, this isn't right. You know, so in, anyway, um, and, but to find top dead center on your engine is real dicey. You can get close, but it stays, it, the engine appears to stay at top dead center for about 
I don't know, five or eight, eight degrees, that piston comes up and the bottom end is, is moving, but the piston stays in the, all but the same place. So if the cylinder head's off, you can, you can double check and make sure you've got top dead center real easily. But anyway, that's, that's way off on, the, on another subject. Crystal, you, you tried to weigh in there for a second. Yeah, I keep hearing about harmonic balancers, but I've yet to even understand what is it doing? Because my car only has a regular pulley. It has a, your car has a harmonic balancer. Oh, I didn't know that. Yep, it's a it's an inside and outside separated by metal. It's designed to reduce uh, vibrations that are set up in the crankshaft. So it's a it's a good thing. So and your your car That's already has it. Uh, it's sixty six. Okay, uh, it looks like I need to get reacquainted with my pulley. I'm going to do that tomorrow. <laughs> okay, all righty. Okay, do we have any more comments about timing? Hey, John. Yeah, yeah. Paul. Yeah, this is Paul from Wisconsin. Hey, Thank I you. have 15, and, um, digit 15. Got it, but have come. Oh, here, hang on just a second here. I'm going to hit mute all because we've got some background noise. Paul, um, unmute yourself and come come on back in. Okay, I've got a midget 1500, mm -hmm. and I've got the original Zenith Stromberg carburetor on there, mm -hmm. and I'm seeing that you know the car the car performs pretty well, but I I'm seeing a tailpipe full of uh, soot, and I'm wondering if this is a timing issue, or is this a carb issue, or maybe both, or maybe something that I don't know. What do you think? Well, it's, it's probably a carburetor issue, um, but just make sure your timing, again, your car's 32 before at, at full mechanical advance, vacuum disconnected. So you need a, you've got a lot of timing marks on the front of that, um, uh, on that cover seems to me, but use a, almost always you got to use a towel back timing light. Once you're, you're established and you're 32 at full mechanical advance, then you can work on the, on the carburetor. And the easier thing to do is use that tuning tool, the eighth inch Allen wrench with a barrel around it. Yes, I've got one. Lean out, lean out the mixture as much as you can, so, but it's still got to run correctly. Sometimes the choke sticks on, that's not uncommon. And to figure out whether it's the carburetor or the choke, which is giving you a problem, you take the three screws out of the, the three copper colored slotted 1032 screws um, that are in a triangle and pull them off and let, let the automatic choke uh, just dangle loose. Of course, this is really hard to do because your bonnet's in the way and it's, you can hardly see what you're doing there, but you separate the choke from the carburetor and then make a determination if it's, if it's running correctly. If it is and you hook the choke back up and it goes rich, well, then you know that the, there's a problem with the, with the uh, automatic choke. Okay. Thank you, sir. I'll give it a try. Okay. Well, hey, it's 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 all but eight o'clock, so I want to I want to start over on the chat section here and uh, and give everybody you know everybody a, a their due here. So again, um, if you go to my website, you can find that PayPal button on the right hand side that says uh, "Help John and Forge's Retirement," and I do truly appreciate your contributions. Okay, Tracy Mekovic. 69 MGB started fine two days ago, but when I turned the key, no fuel pump clicks, no starter noise, and the red alternator light comes on dimly or not at all. The battery's at 12, 12 volts. The terminals are cleaned and retightened. The headlights come on, but very dimly. The main fuse has 12 and a half volts. Don't know what it could be. So this is the this is the danger in using not the danger. This is the trouble using a voltmeter instead of a test light. A test light actually draws current, and the problem that you've got is you're you're not getting the bad you're not getting electricity out of the battery. So why not? Um, it might be that 
the terminals are, are they're tight, but they're corroded. It might be that the, the ground strap from the battery to the frame back there is faulty. Are, are you running a, a single single 12 volt battery or are you still running twin sixes? I'm running a single, John. Okay, in that group 26 probably on the, on the passenger side? Yes. Okay, all right. So, um, you know, you just gotta make sure those, those clamps are real good in the, in the connection to the, to the ground is good. And sometimes the only way to find out if you just put a wrench on it and tighten it, of course it's tight because it's been tight for 48 years, or 58 years, however mm -hmm. long a 69B is. And uh, sometimes you actually have to take that stuff loose and replace the nut and bolt, but also go down on the starter motor itself. Jack, the, you can do this blind, but it's easier if you jack it up and undo the nut that holds the main battery cable to the solenoid. Now you can do this without disconnecting the battery if you're careful, but if your wrench touches the sump or the frame or something, you'll, you can get a real big spark down there and it scares you. If you have the car jacked up and you're working on the starter motor, it sure better be in neutral because if you happen to touch the, the lead that energizes the starter motor and it works, the starter motor will push it right off the jack stand. So make sure it's in neutral. Absolutely. Anyway, okay. un undo the nut um, and take the, there's a, the main battery cable is about as big around as your little finger. And then there's a series of heavy brown wires there. Pull them all out, stretch them out, um, uh, tighten the nut that's underneath, underneath all everything else, and then put everything back on and tighten it all back up, and that will probably do it. Probably. Uh, uh, unless he left the trunk lid open and the and the battery actually is discharged. Except it's a 69B, and they only pick up a trunk light starting in 72. So yes, that. Later cars, absolutely, if the battery can be discharged. I um, didn't mean to 72 and I left the damn trunk lid open. Yep. Yeah. So if you use your test light, um, you, can, you can check to see where the problem lies by doing a voltage drop test. So you take your, your um, um, but if you're, you have to have a real long lead on the, on the, test light because you want to go from your starter motor case back to the post on the battery with your test light. So you're going from the ground on the battery to the ground on the, on the case of the starter motor and, and then have someone actuate the, you know, turn the key over to start and you're going from ground to ground. So the test light shouldn't light up. If it does, bingo, there, there's your problem. The other test is from the center of the positive post to the um, post on the on the starter motor itself, which is really hard to get to. I mean, you're going to be underneath the car and have a long extension on, on your test light. And again, you hit the starter switch, turn it over to start, but the, um, and see if the light glows then. If it does, Means you've got a high resistance someplace. That's a voltage drop test. But I just clean up those starter motor lugs and, and the battery lugs again and the ground and the ground and see what's going on. You can also put a voltmeter across the battery. After me saying that don't use a voltmeter, but it's real handy in some cases. Turn it over to start. And if the if the voltage of the battery drops at that point, then something's going on with the battery itself. But more than likely, I'd, I'd go for the starter motor. That's, that's, that's common to everything that you've, you've talked about here. So I have an ammeter, <clears throat> excuse me, I have an ammeter hooked up uh, in my dash too. So when I turn the key on, it does dip to the negative um, quite a bit. Or when I turn the, try to turn the headlights on, it dips to the negative side. Okay, all right. Ammeters are real dangerous. They're, they're, they're carrying a whole lot of current and there's a bunch of extra connections you've got to make. Um, I, I personally, I'm, I'm, not, I'm no fan of an ammeter just because of the dangers that, that are inherent in the wiring and, and the trouble that you have sometimes. It could be that there's a, 
there's a problem on the back of the, of the ammeter and that's what's causing the headlights not to work, for instance. But it doesn't take a lot of energy to, to, uh, to energize the starter motor. So you're gonna just have to go connection to by connection and, and either test it or, um, or just go through and clean the connections anyway in, until you get it to, to operate correctly. And if you want to know more about that voltage drop test, Tracy, you can call me tomorrow and I can explain that just a little bit more. You can look it up online, but the whole point is that you parallel a circuit with a test light. And when you operate whatever you're going to operate, in this case, the starter motor, uh, the test light shouldn't glow at all because all the electricity ought to be going the way it's supposed to be going. If the electricity can't go that way, then it'll go through the test light and light the test light up. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, you. Where, where, where are you calling from? Kalamazoo, Michigan. Hey, all right, not, not too far from here. Oh my gosh, and you got Ingle right there. So that's a handy place for, for buying the parts that you need. <laughs> that's very handy, yes. Yep. Thanks, thanks John. Hey, you're very welcome. All right, next one up, we got John W. I bought a 54 TF the year and a half ago. The car has an amber driving light and a clear one. I'd like to find um, either color so they match. Any idea where I can get a Lucas driving light lens? So, John W., you're still there? I'm here. Okay, so the hot setup, of course, is um, on, your, on your dash is to put a two-step on there. No, you don't want to do that because you got one which is a driving light, but the yellow one is to pierce fog. And it's really hard to find those fog. Uh, you're not going to probably go out and drive in heavy fog anyway, but um, um, <laughs> no. you, you, you could operate those. You could operate those on two separate circuits. But anyway, um, uh, someplace to find that lamp. Um, my go-to. Yeah, and I, I don't care which one. I, I just would like them to match. My go-to guy always is Paul Deershaw. It's Sports Car Craftsman in Denver, Colorado. Sports Car Craftsman. And he's got a, a great, huge, massive supply of used parts. And, and uh, he, he may be able to help you out because it depends on which type of driving light you've got. Okay. Beyond that, I don't know. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm a daytime driver and don't drive it very much, but uh, I would like it, pretty much drive it in parades. I would like it to uh, look can, matching because I get a lot of questions. Why did you do it? And I didn't do it. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. And you're from, where's, where's Blue Ridge, Georgia? Up in the Blue Ridge Mountains, okay. uh, uh, 75 miles north of Atlanta. Okay. All right. All right. Well, thank you very much for, for, for coming in tonight. Well, thank you. All right. Next guy up here, we've got, uh, we've got Ben, who wants to talk about the South Alabama British Car Club um, in, uh, in Mobile Bay. So, Ben, are you there? Ben is not yes, here. I, I am here. Hey, okay. Hey, hey John. Hey, thanks for lunch, dinner. Look, well, we were glad to have you. Are you going to uh, be down in Gulf Shores uh, around that time? Uh, yeah, the creek don't rise, Deus Valente, absolutely. <laughs> yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. We would love to have you at our show this year. Oh, uh, I might be for there for, for the show, but I'm going to be oh, there okay. in, next February. Okay. So. Well, so, uh, that, so, that's a little plug for our show. Uh, you know, thank you for uh, 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 reading my chat. So, um, it you know, our, our little club in, in South Alabama has a, a show every year in February. No, not in February, in October uh, over in Fairhope. Um, and it's, uh, we've had it for 32 years now. So uh, we get about 120 cars. Um and uh, about uh, twice that many people that uh, come and see all of our cars. This year we're having a, um, 
a valve cover race. So that's uh, oh a yeah, new okay, yeah, <laughs> okay. That's All right. It. Well, hey, thanks a lot, very much. I look forward right. to seeing you in, in February again. Good, thank you. Right. Okay, and I've already talked about timing. Um, Tom Booth, what is the date for the Marshall Show? That is uh, Sunday, October 9th. Tom, that's the Hunt Country Classic. And on my, um, on my uh, constant contact uh, email, there was a link to the Washington DC MG Car Club, which had information about that. All right, here we go. Dean Webb, any information or any problem areas when changing out a right rear splined hub on a 67 MGB GT? Dean, are you still on? Let's see if Dean comes on. But there aren't any problems other than getting the nut loose on a rear hub on a, on a, on a wire wheel car. That's a one and five sixteenths nut, so it's pretty good size. You gotta have an air wrench to get the thing off. Um, or, or maybe if you just lift that wheel up off the ground and you have a friend who's inside the car with his foot on the brakes and just, just jammed on the brakes and it's in gear, maybe you can turn that nut loose, but oh my gosh. What we usually did in the shop because there's a split pin, cotter pin, through that castellated nut, is you just drive a socket over it, rattle it loose, and shear the, shear the pin. Uh, that's bad technique, but it's fast technique. Uh, you can go in there with great difficulty and extract that pin first. Once the nut's loose, there's a tapered washer underneath the nut. And you can go at that with a long prick punch and hit it until it comes loose. Then all you do is grab the hub and a hammer and, and tunk the hub. Uh, probably better to have the brake drum off anyway, but if you're just pulling on the hub and you tunk it with a hammer, it'll just slip off the splines. So it's once you get the nut off and the, and the conical washer off, it's just straightforward. Scott Coles, are you still on with us? Yes, sir. Hi, John. Hey, okay. We got a 73 MGB uh, with steering issues. Uh, solved an issue with a, with a steering being very tight. Um, and that, that issue unmasked other problems, additional problems. I have a problem with a steering column where there's too much rotational play in the column. I assume there should be none. Can we talk about the collapsible steering column and how to fix this problem? Absolutely. But to fix it, Scott, you have to make it non-collapsible. I've, I've seen pictures of people welding them or putting bolts in there. There's all kinds of things. There's, there was, yeah. there's, a, there's a bunch of uh, uh, information about using hot glue to try and replace the uh, uh, wasted away plastic that's in there. Uh, so I guess I'm wondering what is the uh, wisdom, the 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 well, on that. the you got the columns out of the car. Well, I haven't the, haven't done anything yet. I'm oh just my gosh. I'm, I'm working through this. I don't we want to take to, it apart. We used to yeah. do this in place, and of course there's a there's a oh, steel mesh. There's a piece yeah. of plastic that covers the steel mesh. Then you can see the steel mesh. And when I was, you know, when I was 30 years old, you could climb underneath there, and use a <laughs> drill, and you didn't worry about getting shavings in your eye. And you, first of all, you could get in there. Can't do that anymore. So now the steering column comes out of the car. If it'll come out, because you've got to get the steering U-joint off it, so that means you've got to soak it in WD-40 or break away or something away. You've got to soak it for a long time so you can get the column apart. The column will come out, but it'll leave if if um, if the steering U joint is um, is real st stiff. It leaves the the bottom um, the bottom part of the of the column still in there. 
So anyway, it, it can be a, 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 a real task. Yeah. Anyway, the, the column is, a, is a, um, a Roman, what they call a Roman D. It's, it's not a circle. It's a circle with a top and bottom slid off it. And the, and the, the, inner, the inner column fits inside the outer column. And it's, uh, they're the same size. It's almost an interference fit. But, but over a period of time, once that plastic is used up, then the inner column starts to turn on the outer column and, and it, it opens up that opens up that D. So you've got to you've got to put that in a vise and tighten it up so it'll fit back in there. What a hassle. Yeah. Um, yeah. So anyway, I've got, a, I've got about three eighths of an inch as measured on the outer circumference. OK, so in your you, you felt the U joint and turned the wheel and you're sure it's not in the U joint. I, I used vice grips on the upper end of the U-joint and, and held that securely against uh, the, the exhaust manifold in my case. Okay. The play is definitely in the... Okay, that's so frustrating because the, mo the beauty of rack and pinion steering is that, is that there's, no, there's no free play. Yeah. So, um, so, so that, the, that was yeah. one of the things. I, as I say, there's, there's some documentation of that. I didn't know how you felt about the, about the hot glue method of kind of re repacking that air plastic if you were to heat up if you were to heat up the inner and outer columns to where it would hold the hot glue and then and then gob a whole lot of hot glue on there first of all you get to squeeze it so yeah. that, so that, because the hot glue is going to keep it from Understood. Wiggling. Not not after the first 11 turns <laughs> it'll break <laughs> it'll break loose so you got to tighten it up and then, and then if you did put the, because there's some bands in there, if you put the hot glue in there and the, and the two pieces are hot enough to keep that hot glue from setting up and then slip it together. Well, I think you put it together and then inject the glue through the holes that you... You still want to have those columns hot. Yes, yes, understood. Um, so that, that, that could work. I've never tried, I never thought of it. There's a, there's a there's a couple of uh, uh, there's a pretty extensive uh, article about that on the MG Experience website in the in the document section. Okay. Okay. But I, I didn't know how anybody felt about that. So that that's something I can address. I'm not averse to putting a, a shear pin in there of some sort. Uh, so that that's part of what has come out of this. Uh, by the way, I saw your uh, your video number eighty four is where I figured out what was causing the binding in the in the steering. We last time we talked about uh, the swivel pins, and it it wasn't that at all. It was definitely the misalignment of the rack. Oh my gosh! Okay. But anyway, so I'm sure that's been that way for a while. I've only owned the car for this is the second season now. I'm sure it's been that way for a while. The the lower bushing on the steering column is shot. That that jiggles. So I'm going to have to do something with that. And the, the, uh, the pinion bushing on the rack itself, I'm reasonably certain is gone. The, the, the oil seal is certainly gone. Uh, the oil seal I can get, the bushing is listed as not available. That should, it's just a fractional bushing. I guess that's what I'm wondering. Can I get something from McMaster? Sure. Will fit in there? From McMaster car from, uh, um, uh, what's the other, um, I just got the seals. 7445 seals um, from uh, hmm. uh -huh. Moss sells the, the one for the end of the rack at 65 bucks or whatever for a okay. um, I, I, would, I would think that you could, you could you could get that or or if it's you know if if it's been run dry for just too long you know, you can get a used rack and pinion and rebuild it. New ones are available, um, but they're, yeah. they're, um, uh, they're not as easily worked with as the original ones. I'd like to keep it, you know, the car is nothing special. It's a driver, but I'd like to keep it together, you know. I'm sure that's, I'm, that's must be a three quarter by seven eighths bushing or something or other. I think that's the, 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 uh, Outside diameter of the pinion is is a th three quarters. So. Three quarters. Yeah. 
But that was a, the steering was so tight that I could steer into a corner. And if I let go of the wheel, it would just keep steering in a circle. <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's creepy. So it, it now drives like a sports car after I did uh, put the 5 16 washers in there. It actually, it actually performs now, which is so much better. But, but now it leaks all the oil out of the rack and the, the uh, steering column has its issues. So Sure. Right. So that, the bottom bushing on the column, the bottom bushing on the column is, is um, um, ball bearings. And they're little, ti and they're little tiny, tiny things. And it was crimped with a plate on it after it was assembled. So you can't add anymore. If, it's, if it gets real loose and real beat up, some of the balls will drop out of there. You could check, I, again, my favorite guy is Paul Deershaw, it's sports car craftsman. There are other people that sell used parts too, but you should be able to get another used column too. Um, yeah. Although that, that looseness is, is not uncommon. Yeah. All right, well, I think the, I'll wait till the end of the season and take the column out, and uh, at least I won't have any yeah. down days. Yeah, I, I rebuilt the column in my daughter's car, and I rebuilt, um, I rebuilt uh, two rack and pinions. What? Just a couple weeks ago, so. Very good. Right, and Scott, where, where are you calling from? Uh, Massachusetts, done. north of Boston. Okay, all right, all right, thanks. Good luck. Thank you. I'm going to hit you all here because we've got some background noise. And now we're going down to Martha Ann, Mick, somebody. And it may be Martha and it may be somebody on Martha's, um, McKillop. Are you there with the MGA, the 58 MGA, the resto? Hi, John. It's Martha. It is Martha. Okay. It's so unusual to have women here. Oh, my gosh. So let's see, we're doing a restoration on the 58A. We've not kept it completely stock. Hey, it's your car. Paint it pink with purple polka dots. It's your car. We're now at the <laughs> point where we need to determine the direction of the motor. Can you talk about your thoughts on the, on the, on the uh, engine and gearbox uh, that will make the car enjoyable to drive um, and keep the value or increase it? Um, um, so what uh, what makes the most sense here? Okay, so um, the the 15, 50, 58, so it's a 1500. One of the fastest MGAs I ever drove in my life was a 1500. So you can extract a lot of a lot of power out of that engine. Where, where are you calling from? Colorado Springs, Colorado. Oh my gosh, well you're right up the road from Paul Deershaw. So um, it's sports car craftsman. So, yep. um, so the possibilities are, are using the existing 1500 engine, or if you want, you can jump, jump up to an 1800 engine out of an MGB. If you go too new, that is after 1964, there's no provision to drive the tachometer with a cable. At that point, you fit a, an electronic tachometer which looks exactly like your tachometer, except it no longer says Jaeger on it, it says Smith's, which if you look at it, you go, oh my gosh, you know, it's electronic, but you can do that and it'll, you know, the face looks just fine. Or you can take your mechanical one and send it to West Valley Instruments in uh, around San Francisco and they will put modern guts in it so that you drive it off a, um, a signal from your coil rather than from a cable. So those are the two 1800 engines. Um, but in, in how much difference does 300 cc's make? Well, I don't know. If it's a, if it's in a syringe and they're injecting you, it's a lot, you know. But it, you know, 300 cc's isn't isn't very very much. And you can make that 1500 engine wake up by using a, a good camshaft and getting the the cylinder head um, corded. And increasing the compression, so you can do that. Keep the same carburetors. The carburetors are just great. Uh, you get a distributor that's the same, or the same, or the distributor that matches the the type of upgrade that that you're doing. But um, keep keep points. Absolutely keep points in there. The gearbox. That's a question. There are Japanese gearboxes with conversions, uh, bell housings, and stuff 
looks just the same inside the car, shifts a little differently. Synchronized in first, second, third, fourth. Um, great, people rave about them. They're, they, you can get them with five gears, so they get overdrive. Um, they're really, really nice. I, I think maybe the whole kit maybe is 4,500, five grand, or you can rebuild your gearbox and there's no problem with that. I've got a 62 MGA that I run myself in, and uh, it's just got the, the a crash first, which means you've got to be completely stopped when you engage first or reverse. But I put a, I put a 3.9 differential in my MGA, which is an MGA differential, uh, MGB differential. And um, when I'm doing five grand, uh, I'm doing 90 miles an hour. So that, that's, you know, you can, you can drive it on the expressway. I've got a 1622 engine in mine. It's got a, a VP12 camshaft in it, which is a high speed cam that doesn't work so well around town, but out on the road. It's great. I like to drive fast and that allows me to go really fast. So anyway, it's, it's um, um, you know, do you keep it original? I'm, I'm, I tend towards that. I'd keep the same gearbox and change the differential. Um, but, and then you sort of get the best of both worlds. Um, but it's not as nice as an all synchro gearbox, a Japanese gearbox. I was just talking to Forrest Johnson who took over my business and uh, um, he said that they fit lots and lots of those gearbox conversions will make the car worth more or less. I don't think it, I don't think it changes the value very much at all. So. Okay. I appreciate the input. Thank you. Yeah. And if you got any questions, just call me. My, my number's on the site and uh, on, on my website and I can talk to you more about specific uh, stuff about the engine or specific stuff about the gearbox. Yeah, no worries. I just want to get out and enjoy the car, but, you know, living in the Rockies, want to make sure that um, I don't get run over. So thank you. You're very welcome. All right. Rich to everybody. Rich, are you on uh, 60 MGA? I yes, I am. Okay which I haven't driven at all this year due, due to a paint job in progress, but I've been starting it and running it for a few minutes every week or so. I'm not a fan of doing that. Um, I, I just leave it not started. That's me. It's super hard to start. It takes a dozen or so attempts before it finally fires up. If I use starter fluid, it starts the first time. So that's either because the gasoline is old, we've talked about that already, gasoline over a year old just doesn't want to ignite, or it's because you're not pulling the choke out far enough, or the choke is maladjusted, misadjusted, and it isn't dropping the jets. The jet should drop a quarter to three eighths of an inch, a long way. If they, if they drop that far, it will start. Um, also, um, when I, when I press down on the gas, the throttle, the engine RPMs go down and it nearly stalls out. And if I, if, if I press it really gently, slowly, it'll gradually speed up. Now, I bet, I bet this is just because, how, how long has this thing been off the road, Rich? Oh, uh, I drove it, uh, it was driving perfectly in the fall. So last year, uh, nine months ago, or well, I guess almost a year ago now. Where, where are you? Uh, just north of Chicago. Okay. All right. Well, you know, I, I wouldn't worry too much about, about it until it's all done and you're back on the road and you get some fresh gas in it. But just more about starting it up every now and then. If you start it up and run it for 20 minutes, um, at a higher RPM, that's okay because it blows all the water out of the exhaust system and the exhaust gets hot enough to evaporate the gasoline. But if you run it for just 10 minutes or so, um, it doesn't get hot enough and you get all that condensation inside your exhaust system. And I don't think it does any good anyway. It, it can sit, it can sit still for a long time 
and and uh, fire back up again when it has to. So, so that's really interesting. Uh, yeah, I just I've been starting up. Well, I have to because when I paint, um, I have to pull the MG out of the garage. Oh, okay, all right. You know, so I I have to pull it out anyway. Uh, without uh, any fenders on it, it's uh, probably slight, slightly less than legal. Um, no headlights, no turn okay. signal, that, right. that type of thing. And the back ones don't work in that case anyway. Um, so, you know, I figured, okay, well, let's just start up, let it run for, you know, five, 10 minutes and a little exercise is better than no exercise, but that's actually really interesting. I, I had not thought about the condensation uh, uh, aspect of that. It's, it just goes back to my youth. My grandfather uh, drove from his house to his business, and it was um, about a, a five-minute run, and he put an exhaust system on there every year, I swear, every other year. It was a Cadillac. It was really expensive, but it, it, it stuff wasn't made so well back then, but it just rusted out from the, from the inside out. So. Interesting. So, so, yeah, I guess I'm wondering... Um, yeah, gas is probably an issue. I haven't filled it up since last year. So, you know, the volatile glass, gas is well, probably if you, going off. If you, put, if you put in, I don't know, a bunch of gallons of, of high test, I mean, 90, whatever you buy in Illinois, Wisconsin, 91, 92 octane, and then, and then pull the, the fuel line off and pumped out, I don't know, better part of a quart, at least a pint, to just get all the old gas out of the fuel lines and then started it up, I bet it would start to run well um, after, after it warmed up and you got the fresh gas in the float bowls. The car will run for five minutes with a gasoline that's just in the float bowl. So you've got to run it for a while yeah. to get that gas circulated and fresh gas in there. I'm going to actually try that tonight. I'll, I'll try uh, putting some 93 in there. Uh, tonight to see if that helps. Um, but I, I guess my big question, I just want to make sure, I think this is a carb issue. Well, if it's not a gas issue, it's a carb I'm, issue because I, I step on the gas pedal and it drops. And I seem to remember, you know, it's, I do these jobs like once a year, so it's hard to keep a memory. But I seem to recall like uh, there was something about the oil in the carbs, uh, in the carb tubes. Like if you press on the gas, you know, it gets too lean or something like that. I wasn't sure. Um, there is there there is oil in the dash pots on the top of the carburetors. Yep. And the thicker the oil, the better. That restricts the upward motion of the air piston. If it's unbelievably stiff, I mean, like um, got a viscosity instead of fifty weight or eighty ninety, it's two hundred or something rather. Then yes, maybe. May, but when you're trying to accelerate. It would um, it, it would run really 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 rich, be blowing a whole lot of black smoke at the same time you were trying to accelerate, but that would be pretty bizarre. It could be that there's crap on the air pistons because of the bondo dust or the paint or something or other on the inside of the air pistons against the suction chambers, and the pistons don't want to rise. It could be as, as simple as that. You got air cleaners on it yet? Oh yeah, yeah. I, I kept it covered in plastic the entire time. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, I, I replaced the air filters with modern ones. What kind of modern ones? Uh, God, it was uh, last year. I can't remember. Um, if you say it, I'll know it. Frem, maybe is that something right? Well, there's there's um, is it is it a, a sandwich chrome kind of filter? Or the trapezoidal? Oh God, I I don't know. Or anyway, you, you can um anyway the the original air filter you can't get better than the original air filters on the MGA if oh. if they're if they're still I, original. I have those. Uh, no, I have those. Uh, I took my replacement with these. I just felt like anything like uh, smaller than a it it would it would filter anything larger than a pebble, you know. So I just felt a little safer. With these, hey, well, then that's yeah. The original air filters are are wire mesh. Yeah, and the, and I have like, those. Yep, those are those are good. Those are you, you have to yeah. oil wet them. You got to no, put oil I, on them for them to work. Yeah. I took them off. They're on my workbench. I kept okay. them, uh, but I you know I, I put the new ones on. I can't remember the brand name. I want to say Fram, but I could be completely wrong. 
I'm 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 trying to think of the the modern um, the go-to filter that everybody wants to use now, um, and I'm just blank. I can't. K and M. Thank you. K and M N. Yeah, that's it. And, that's it. Oh, that's those th those filters are great. Those are the same type of construction as the original yep. ones. So okay, all right. Okay, well, um, you know, you try that gasoline trick. If if it doesn't work, uh, give me a call and and I'll I'll see if I can I, if I can help you out. I'm gonna try it tonight. Thank you. Okay. Good luck. Okay, my next my next question up is from David uh, Basili, and I may be mispronouncing your name. Um, if you're still on, David. Either David's not on or he isn't coming on. I but, am on. Oh, here we go. Great. How do you pronounce your last name? Al Silly. Al Silly. All right. All right. Um, um, yeah, static time is a perfect way when you first start the engine up. That's, I mean, that's the only way um, that, that you can you can do it. Well, you can you can get the distributor where you think it it should be, and as long as it starts. And then put a strobe on it and, and adjust it. But if you're just, you know, if you're just doing a quick start up and stuff like that, um, static timing is just great. Where where are you calling from? I'm from Omaha. Oh gosh! All right. What year and model do you have? I have an eighty MGB. So that came with it originally came with electronic ignition. Have you retrofitted points on that or is it still electronic? Well, it's electronic, but it's Petronics instead of the original electronic box. I had a lot of tr trouble with that electronic box and it was kind of expensive to replace. Yes. So I changed it all to Petronics and boy, that's really worked very nice. Make sure you've got another. Um, Plate. Did you put a plate on the inside of your existing distributor, or did you buy a whole Petronics distributor? Actually, I had a uh, different distributor. There was a fellow that does work on MGBs here in Omaha, and he changed the distributor so that the Petronics would work better in that. And through your advice, I keep a spare Petronics in my <laughs> Trunk. That, that's where I was going with that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Works or it doesn't, right? Yep. That's right. Exactly so. But exactly uh, so. the electronic ignition, I really had a lot of trouble with condensers going out a lot of times. So I said, okay, heck with it. Uh, I'm not an originalist. I want, you know, reliability. And this Petronics has really worked well. Good. Good, good. Okay, no, cool. Thanks very much. We're going to go to Ben now, who's got wonders where the numbers are on the distributor. Of course, I don't have a distributor in front of me to show you, but um, Ben, are you still on? If Ben's on, he'll come on, but you've got to take the distributor out of the car. In, in, when you do anything with the distributor, you got to take it out of the car. People say, oh, but. I don't want to take it out of the car. You know, you can't put points and condenser in a distributor in place. You just, I mean, it'll stand on your head. Take it out of the car. You're going to change the timing anyway. So take it out of the car. Put it up in the vice where you can actually see it and work on it. It's so much easier up there. And all you got to do is look around the around the case, and you'll see the the number on on the distributor. 41188 or 40897 or 41427, um, along with it, along with a build date. Um, we don't have any, anybody who's who's uh, so in, intense on the distributors um, as they are on the SUs for for build dates, but um, but maybe that maybe that's coming. Anyway, it's right right on the body. You can't can't miss it. You got to pull it out to read it. Okay, so now we're now we're up to Rich, um, and it says depends on the SU, um, and I wonder, 
um, what Rich is answering. He says, depends on the SU, on the MGA, I, I believe, believe it's on it. the Yes. I was answering the question about where you could find the SU uh, numbers. Oh, okay. All right. Yep. It is. It's on a little aluminum tag um, on the on the flow chamber, which is long since gone. <laughs> I, I'm sure on almost all of we we had we, we I worked on a lot of cars and and it's really rare to see those little tags still on there. So um, AUC three twenty eight or something. On them. Yep. Thanks, Rich. Where where are you calling from? Oh, we uh, we just chatted, John. I'm oh. uh, just north of Chicago. Yes. All right. Oh, got gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. No problem. Okay, Stefan Bergsman. John, as you are recording these sessions, is it possible to view these recordings somewhere on YouTube or on the internet? Yes. Over here in Europe. I'm in Vienna, Austria. It is short after midnight when you do these sessions. It's not so easy to join from over here. So yes, Stefan, yes, absolutely. Are you still on or are you probably gone to bed by yes, now? I'm still here. I'm oh, still you here. Are. Hey, all right. So yes, they're on YouTube. And if you um, um, go on University Motors LTD, you'll find them. Thanks very much. So what, what year and model do you have? An MGA Mark II, 61. Oh, good, wonderful. Is there, is there, a, um, is there an MG Car Club Austria? Uh, yes, actually I'm a member of the Austrian MG Club here, yes. Good, good. Well, thanks very much for coming in. Thank you. Okay, Barry Jacobs, what is your, opinion on ethanol free gasoline. So we talked about that a lot tonight, Barry, and, and, and if you need it, use it. Not all cars need it. I don't, I don't use it in my MGA, but some cars need it, absolutely. And if you're having problem with boiling, um, Stefan, you're, Stefan's still in, on my screen. Stefan, what, what kind of gasoline do you have in Europe? Can you get eth well, no, different no. kind. We have we have ethanol mixed. Uh, I think ten percent ethanol in in the gasoline, and octane is ninety five or hundred. Okay, but is it possible to find ethanol free gasoline? Uh, I'm not sure, but I will check tomorrow. I already took a note. Okay, all right. <laughs> because I got the same problem. Okay, yeah. It's just it's there's just there's no solution to it. Well, that's not true. Um, Joe Curto sells those socks. They're not made out of asbestos, but the socks that you can put over the, over the float bowls, and that can help. But once that underbonnet temperature gets up too high, it's just, it's a lost cause. So, John Tershak, you're up next. Um, um, and uh, MGA, tight turn, left rear, uh, uh, tight turn left. I hear metal to metal on the right rear wheel. Haven't taken the drum off to check, but it could could it be something loose in the brake drum or the rear hub bearing? When you turn, when you turn, there's always some flexing that's going on. There's, all, I mean, incremental, right? But it's just enough that the backing plate, no doubt, this is what the problem is. The backing plate is touching the hub. So you can either wait until it, it all grinds away. But if you take the hub, I mean, if you take the, the rear brake drum and you take that off, you can see where it's scraping. Um, and you can, you can grind that down a little bit and that'll stop it. It doesn't hurt anything. It just drives you crazy. You think, oh my gosh, something's going on. John, are you still on with us tonight? Don't hear John, so. Anyway, that's uh, that's MGBs, all of them, and it just is the backing plate is is too close to, to the brake drum, and, and when you go around it, stresses the brake drum, and the brake drum ends up touching. It runs really, really close. Larry Shore, Larry, are you still on? I am here. Okay. Yesterday we worked on the ignition system of 52D TD. Uh, one of the potential problems we looked at was the condition of the condenser. 
does not seem there's a good way to test the condenser to confirm it's good. So um, I tried setting my, my voltmeter to ohms and observe the condenser charging up then reversing. Um, um, so did it do that? Are you on a are you on a, a meter or are you on a, a, a digital display? It's a digital multimeter, and I found the readings to be inconsistent when I checked a couple of my different condensers. The only thing that I could differentiate that was perhaps significant is some of them seem to change their resistance reading slowly and some quickly. But even that seemed to be a subjective assessment, and I wasn't sure that that was telling me anything meaningful. But um, what I found really interesting is the next paragraph I mentioned, where um, I discovered, not previously known to me, although I've had this Craftsman multimeter for many years, is that it actually allowed me to select capacitance setting as one of the submenus, I'll call it, of the um, ohm setting. And that allowed me to get reproducible um, uh, readings, uh, which were in terms of nanofarads. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've seen, uh, it was actually on Barney Gaylord's website, a suggestion that a uh, condenser would typically have a reading of between 250 and 290 um, nanofarads. And I discovered most of the few condensers I had were in that range. A couple were well outside that range and the condenser in my TD um, read 579 um, nanofarads, I'll call it. And so then the question is, is that reading 579 nanofarads sufficiently out of range that it in fact was a likely suspect condenser? And is that range between 250 and 290 a consistent determinant of a good condenser? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't I, I don't know. It's you know they, they used to be listen, I, I saw this nanofarad and I thought, well, that's interesting because they used to be micro microfarads, right? Um, um, the only thing, the only thing you can't do with your meter is bring the voltage up, you know, and test it at a couple hundred volts, right? Which is the the primary back feed, you know, that, that you get when the points open, and right. that's the, that's the 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 nice thing about a, a capacitance, a capacitor tester is you can test it under under load, you know, so. Um, I don't know if it makes any difference if it's 250 or 500. I, I don't, it doesn't seem, if they're micro microfarads, it doesn't seem like, you know, what, what's the difference between a, a dot and a, and a dot and a, and a half or something? Um, it doesn't seem like it probably would, that would make any difference. What does make a difference is if it breaks down, you know, right. um, under, that, under that voltage. And that's, that's what causes the car to run poorly. Right. Well, I, I did discover that difference, as I said. So I have a condenser that I put in, which is within that 250 to 290 spec. And so it'll be interesting to see whether that causes any change in performance. I was seeing um, some hesitant starts from stop, um, which could be a number of different things. So I went through the timing and changed plugs and did other uh, and checkpoints and all. Um, I did one other thing that I also want to ask you about, which is not in the emission system, it's on the carburetor side, which I always do last after I'm confident that the ignition is set up properly. Um, and that was that I noticed that the dash pot oil was somewhat down. Well, actually, I didn't measure exactly, but it was down in the carburetors. And I took advantage of the opportunity to change it to a different fluid than I've used in the past. In the past, I've used 20 weight in the dash pots. Um, somebody had suggested to me, and this person has an MGA, so this may or may not be transferable, that Marvel Mystery Oil was his suggestion of an optimal fluid. And while I did switch to that, I was actually surprised to see that it was less viscous than the 20 weight oil. And I wanted your opinion as to whether or not I'm going in the wrong direction. That I can answer. <laughs> and I think you're going, I, I, my, my gut is you're going in the wrong direction. You want to restrict the upward movement of the air piston as much as possible right. so that you stay rich. 
by holding the venturi artificially small, you increase the vacuum at the jet, you get more, more gasoline, the, the mixture is enriched. The whole point is to enrich in the mixture at acceleration. And if the piston rises too quickly, it won't be as rich as if you suppress that movement. And I, I tell everybody to use 90 weight gear oil, although the oil guys like Glenn at Glenn's MG service in, in uh, Florida, Glenn says, you know, the viscosity of, of, fifth, of, I don't know, 50 weight and 90 weight is the same because they're measured on different scales. But 90 weight gear oil, look at that, how thick that is. I swear if you put a, a ball bearing in that and count the number of seconds it takes to fall, it's a whole lot faster than 20 weight. So I, I tell everybody use 90 weight. Just that's, you know, that's, and if you don't like it, take it out and put something else in. But right. the, reason, the reason that you think that you need oil in there is because um, it, I, I, some of it splashes out or gets, um, comes out the top. As long as you hit resistance, just, at the, just as you hit the threads, Right. As long as there's oil, just as you hit the threads, that's all the oil that you need. You don't need to have it above that. Anything above that can and does wash out of the system. So, right, washing out of the system though is not a problem because obviously it, I'll call it self levels. Um, if Correct. you go crazy, then maybe you have some carburetor issues for a brief period of time. But ultimately, um, this is interesting information for me because. Uh, I was recognizing the operation of the dash pod as you described. Um, I wasn't sure that the less viscous fluid was, was helping my cause or not. Um, it, and sometimes I've heard um, ambient temperature concerns. If you're driving the car in uh, hot weather or cold weather, there may be a recommendation of having a different oil. I wasn't sure whether something that had mostly viscosity-like characteristics or not, or whether this is something that's overly um, picky, I'll call it, with respect to the car's operation. Well, you know, a Volvo, a Volvo uses um, SUs, and they suggest ATF, automatic transmission fluid, which is pretty lightweight stuff. Right. Looks like, looks like Marvel mist oil. Um, and I think, well, I suppose it is colder up there. <laughs> you, know, I, you know, but our workshop manual always says use engine oil. You know, that's what it says. But over and over, I explain and, and say that that air, you know, the, the dash pot, the piston, the piston is fixed. Right. And, and that air piston has gone up and down how many times since the car was new? 30, 300, 3,000, 30,000, 300,000, probably not 3 million. I don't know. A lot. It's right. gone up and down a lot. And every time it goes up and down, the, the, the steel in, inside the dash pot. Uh, a break, uh, a brakes, um, the because there's little bits of, of dirt caught in that brass plunger, um, and to account for that extra wear on the inside of the of the air piston, um, inside of the dash pot, I like using thick oil. Right. Well, as a matter of fact, when I did a drop test on the piston uh, before I changed out the oil, it took a second, I'll call it, for it to drop. And with the Marvel, Marvel, Marvel Mystery Oil, wishful thinking might suggest it took two seconds instead of one. And I believe that's on the short side of what one should see for a piston drop in the SU, isn't it? To do the proper piston drop, you take the, you take the suction, you take the, the damper off the top and you put masking tape on the air hole. So air cannot get in, into the in, inside uh, up into the top. Uh -huh. And then you and then you drop it and you're and you're you're seeing how good that machined surface is between the outside of the air piston and the inside of the suction chamber. Right. I just used a uh, uh, strained out paper clip going up through the hole in the bottom of the SU. Um, I don't know whether that's present in all SUs, but it isn't a TD, and so I took advantage of it, and that's where I got the timing that I described. Um, yeah, when you, there's, a, there's the piston, I mean, you take that, that, um, that damper out, uh, there's a little bit of free play on that barrel, mm -hmm. just a little tiny bit of free play. So when you hit, when you hit it with a, with a, um, um, 
pin, a piece of wire going up to that air hole, which is the only way that you can do it if the air manifolds on or something. Um, then, then the um, you're you're going first of all you're going through a little tiny tiny bit, <laughs> a little tiny bit of of movement, and and then it is a valve, and and the upward the upward motion is grossly restricted, but because of the valve, when you let loose, it it falls very very quickly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, well, I've taken up too much of your time, John, but this has been great and covered a lot of interesting points. So thank you very much. You're very welcome. Where, where are you again? Lancaster, Massachusetts. Okay. I've never had anybody ask me about the nanofarads, but Barney, Barney's the engineer, so he's got all that kind of stuff on there. <laughs> he called me one time and he said, which way is the MGA fuel gauge wound? He wanted to know the, the direction of the windings. On the inside, I said, "Yeah, I, you know, I only took one, one apart once to realize that that was beyond my my pay grade." So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, hey, thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, before you leave, Larry, uh, I had a question on my MGB. Uh, I had a capacitor fail. It, it went to, um, I think it went to a dead short. Anyway, the car stopped, and so not being able to find a an actual replacement, I just got a whole handful of 22 microfarad condensers from Napa. And because I didn't want to bother with taking the distributor out and replacing them all the time, I, I extended a wire from where the condenser would connect and connected the condenser. They all had the side tab on them, just connected it to the outside of the car. It seemed to work perfectly good to have the condenser on the outside uh, and I'm thinking if John is doing these experiments, that might make it easier. D is there any reason that the condenser has to be inside the distributor? I can't imagine an electron cares about another six inches. No, nope. it, it can be right on the side of the coil. And Larry, Larry Shore, Larry Shore, if you unmute yourself, Larry, and say something, you'll come up on the on the big screen here. He was showing us the plate. Which has got the which has got the the points and the condenser on it, so I can see that right there. Yeah, thank you, Larry. No, that's that's it. If we have the plate, yep, yep. So yeah, they do make a plate with it does not have the condenser on it, and it's got a screw hole in it, so you can remove the condenser. So um, uh, British Vacuum Units has those. I think I don't know if the other guy um, has those as well. Jeff Schlemmer's, uh, yes, I, I think I think they they both do. But yeah, and Rob Medinsky says that his his condensers are good. Right. You know, um, uh, Glenn at Glenn's MG Service in, in in St. Petersburg, Florida, his line was, you know, the automotive industry was making condensers for a hundred years, just perfectly fine, and then about five years ago, they forgot how to make them. But that probably has to do with where they're being made, right? Yeah. The other thing is uh, the, the Mallory dual point uh, distributors you see on MGB sometimes, mm -hmm. they have the condenser on the outside. It's still on the distributor, but you, yes. you, could, you, could mount, you could mount it on the coil. So, yes. Yep. Hey, thanks a lot, Fred. Thanks. Okay, okay I'm going to hit mute all, and we're going to go over to Chris McComb. 72 MGB, when I grab the fan, the whole thing moves. All four of the bolts are tight. A friend said he thinks the water pump is going. Does that sound right? Yes. So Chris, Chris McComb, are you still on, Chris? You waited a long time for your, your question to come up, Chris. Yes, if you can grab the fan and wiggle the fan, then the water pump is bad. So two things go wrong with the, with the water pump. The bearings go bad or the seal goes bad. The bearings can be just trash. They can wobble all over the place and not leak a drop. And the bearings can be absolutely perfect and it just leaks, leaks, leaks. So uh, they sometimes the failures happen in unison, sometimes not. And it's not too bad of a job to change the, the, the water pump. And Marty Bradley, my administrative assistant, has um, a pure gas. She's got the link up on up on the chat section. 
uh, pure-gas.org. So that I, I'm sure there's a, a um, I'm, somebody told me, I, I know there's something that you can get on, on your phone to uh, um, get there. So anyway, and a couple more people, Ben Andrews weighed in about that. Okay, Mike from Massachusetts, Mike C. There's also fuel line insulation that can help a little. Uh, where I am, no gas stations have non-ethanol gas. And when and if they do, it's extremely expensive. Mike, are you still on? Mike from Massachusetts? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, so yes, you can uh, you can take your fuel line. Actually, if you take your fuel line and put it in just inside like half inch heater hose, I mean, just you know, d double up so it's you know big. That helps. Midget fifteen hundreds do get vapor lock. They've got um, they got a steel line that runs over the top of the gearbox of all of all things. Yeah, I ran I ran insulation from the from where it turns from the metal pipe to hose all the way to the carb. I used that installation on it and it seems to have helped. I used 87 gas, 87 octane gas in it. And only sometimes if it sits on a really hot day and I go to restart it 10 minutes later, it might be a little rough for like the first minute and that's about it. Okay, the, the, the real problem with the midget 1500s was vapor lock from that. And, but you've, you replaced that whole line from the tank up to the pump? Yeah, with uh, and I put that insulation on it. Got it off of Amazon. Cool, Amazon. Did the same gas. thing, John. What's that? What's that, George? John, um, I, on my nineteen eighty, I insulated it also from the bell housing all the way up to the carburetor. Okay. Yeah, I was having the same problem. Uh, you drive it for an hour and then pull into uh, to get gas and. Start it back up, and it's all it won't idle because it uh, it's not getting the proper amount of fuel because it's uh, it's creating a, a vapor in there. It's boiling. Yep. R rather than a liquid. So I can weigh in on the gas. Um, looking at ethanol free. At, looking on a pure gas. Um, I buy almost all my gas from Marathon Station in Strongsville. Okay. I get the best mileage from that, but it's listed on those that uh, that don't have ethanol in the gas. And I seem to get the best mileage of Marathon and Sunoco, and both the stations there were listed. I can't imagine if that's the only Marathon station that doesn't have ethanol in, in their premium. <laughs> I mean, hey, who, you know, yeah. who knows? Who knows? But uh, yeah, I get I get the best, best mileage and never had ever had vapor lock. I, I only put brand name gas in it no matter where I go. Okie doke. All right. Bob and Gloria from Ohio. Chuck Linick, also from Ohio, just down the road from Bob and Gloria. John, I now have a 66 MGB. You, you got a Chuck, are you still on? I you know. You've held on all this time? So Chuck's got, um, you've got a, um, a TF also, right? I do. Okay, you're 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 uh, you're going after Tony Shoviak's record here for having as many different MGs as you can in your garage. Um, 66 MGB handbrake wasn't holding. Looked at the adjuster and it was as tight as it could go with the brake cable stretch. This is probably original. The shoes have lots of brake material. One time. We were talking about this before, and the and the the lever that's in the back, mm -hmm. you know that lever yep. that 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 operates the handbrake, those fit left and right, but there's only one correct one, only one correct way for it to go, and I cannot remember which way it was. The lever part of it that is connected to the handbrake cable. I don't know if that's supposed to be on the bottom or the top. I'll propose it's supposed to be on the bottom. And someone said they switched that and it made all the difference in the world. I can't imagine how or why, but that's what they told me. So it is a handbrake. It's designed to hold the car, um, a, a parking brake. It's a parking brake. You put it on when you're parked. 
if you pull it up while the car is moving, it doesn't do anything. It just doesn't, it, you haven't got enough strength to pull it to make it slow down. But, but if you put it on all the way and put the car in first gear, you shouldn't be able to pull away. Yeah, it, 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 the car. Chuck, you still there? Yes. Okay. So. Yeah. Oh, you're breaking up real bad here on the on the voice. If I can see if I if I start it all. But I yep. Yeah. So anyway. Chuck, I, I can't I can't get the audio from you. So anyway, we're going to have to leave that. But that's the scoop, and uh, next time you'll you'll have a a better connection. All right, so we're going to go to Chris Chris McComb. Oh, uh, um, Chuck, I had the same problem. Turns out everything was leaking like a sieve. Uh, um, so check for leaks. That's an idea. Although chances are Chuck's already had the already had the um, the drums off and taken a look because he already looked to see there's a lot of material there. From Paul to everybody, um, any thoughts on fitting a new vinyl hood on my 77B? I had an Amco hood. Oh my gosh, well, it's that's old fashioned. That I got new in '96. I'm looking for any tips on install, or should I find someone to do this? Is there a, a, a video that's available? Paul, are you still on for putting a new soft top on your B? Um, I've done it. I may have only done it once. I've seen it occur a hundred times. We used to put lots and lots of soft tops on. You want to do it in July. Oh, that means you got to wait a year. You got to do it outside when it's really, really hot. So the, the, the top is just, there's no stiffness to it at all. And um, you wanna make sure it's lined up, um, put chalk marks on it so you get it centered, um, centered on the, on the windscreen because you, you can get it off one way or the other. That's always real embarrassing. And, and uh, you use that 3M glue, the 08090 glue, but that's pretty unforgiving. Uh, so you want to make sure that you've you've already put it in place and and got it as tight as you possibly possibly can. So and then, and the the Robin's tops, the Robin's tops are really good tops. Uh, Amco's gone, uh, but Robin's filled the void. So there are other tops or canvas tops. They look cool, but they don't store very well. Um, and um, if you're going to get a canvas top, then you go, oh, I'm going to get a canvas colored rather than black. And that's just a recipe for, for uh, fingerprints and, and marks and scars. So I just get an M Amco top to go with that. All right, our, our next guy up is a 77 MGB. If you're still on, you can come on it. So on my 77, I, I yeah. am. Okay. On my 77B, after either hard acceleration or sustained high speed, say 40 to 50 miles an hour, that's not high speed, or long periods of engine um, braking, then get on the clutch, or as soon as they get um, let off on the gas and come to a stop, it starts to make a clunking noise along with the vibration. I can feel it under the floor. So, I mean, all other things being equal, my... my um, uh, my comment is is uh, check check the drive shaft, check the drive shaft, and of course you got to get underneath the car. Are you on? Can can you can you come on? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, okay, James. All right. So you know the the drive shaft has got two U joints, and if one of the U joints goes bad, then you can get a clunking when you're taking off. Or when you're slowing yeah. down, I do get a clunking when I'm taking off as well. Yeah. Okay, it's often accompanied by a ringing noise um, because it, it acts like a tubular bell. You get a high speed vibration that yes. you, may, you may feel in the in the in your butt or in the rearview mirror. So um, so that's the drive shaft. 
And if, you, if you're doing work on your own car, you take the drive shaft out, the back end comes off easy schmeasy, just bolts the front end, oh my gosh, what a hassle getting that, that thing off. Um, I, I have put a screwdriver through the U-joint, the U-joint's open, and you can put a, U, uh, a screwdriver through there to hold it while you loosen up the nuts. You can either change the U-joint yourself, if you're handy, if you've got a vice, um, you want to follow the instructions I've got on my how to change a U-joint in four and a half minutes. I haven't done a U-joint in four and a half minutes in a long time. Um, that's the fastest I, I ever did one, which is extremely quick, um, extremely. Or you can take your drive shaft to a truck uh, drive shaft place, a drive line specialist. They'll put in two new U-joints, they'll balance it, charge a hundred and a quarter or something like that. And it's just a real deal. And then you can put it back in. So but that's probably what what's going on. Where, where are you calling from, James? I'm from Corning, New York. And before I go, I just want to say thank you. I'd spoken with you about my fuel issue on my MG. And I ordered that original air filter and it fixed it beautifully. You, you got a Stromberg carburetor? Yes. Yep. I, I remember your phone call because... A Stromberg carburetors don't run unless they've got the original factory air cleaner on them. It's yeah. uncanny. Yep. It, it, it is. It was scary. I was confused, but it works. Yep. I was confused too until I until I put the this I had the I had the guy sleep sleep at my house one night because we couldn't make his car run well. And the next day, the next day I said, Well, we're just gonna pretend that the car is all done. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put the air cleaner on it and, and we're gonna Go out and drive it and see what the scoop is. And if that doesn't work, we're gonna we're gonna go back to where we were when we started. And the thing was a rocket. And I said, no. And I took the air cleaner off and it ran like crap. I couldn't believe it. So yeah. You know, anyway, good. Good, good. John, can I add something to that? Yeah, sure, George. Uh, on the later Bs, you got fiber washers and in the differential that go bad. Yes. It will cause a clunk also. That is absolutely true. That is absolutely true. Thank you. So um, James said he was getting a, a, a vibration uh, out of his car. So that's not, that's not from that. But yes, thanks very much. That clunking can be really bad in the differential. When you're on and off and on and off, it's clunk, 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 drive you crazy. It doesn't hurt anything, but it, it can, it just drives you crazy. John. Thanks. John, what Wait does up. it mean when you fa phasing? I heard a term phasing the drive shift. Okay. So there, you've got two U-joints and they're, they're, they're crosses, right? And you've got a fixed axis that goes with the, with the U-joint and you've got a, a flexible axis that goes with the, with the um, uh, gearbox or with, with the differential. And the fixed axes must be parallel. Because the U-joint has a slip joint and it's got teeth on it, you can assemble it this way or this way or this way. And, and if the fixed axes are parallel, it's perfect. And then it goes wrong, wrong, most wrong, wrong, little bit wrong, and, and correct again. So the fixed axes have to be parallel. So can, can you put the drive shaft back together wrong? Absolutely. If you if you slipped it apart, or if the, if the, if the DPO had it a, a, a slipped apart, absolutely. So the only way to tell is to get underneath, you know, and take a look at, at the drive shaft. The drive shaft has got the fixed axes. And, and just turn, you know, just take a look at the drive shaft. And if the front one's going up, the rear one has to be going up too. And if you, I mean, if you don't phase it, what, what kind of... What then, just, then the U-joints don't, don't do their action. You got to go on YouTube and watch and see what happens to a drive shaft. But a drive shaft, you know, is between two points that, that don't have this, you know, don't, they're not straight in. They're mm -hmm. off a little bit. So here's the, here's the back of the gearbox and here's the front of the diff. 
but the from the diff is is the car is the car moves up and down the 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 gearbox actually changes position according to to the diff and as the motions coming out evenly out of the back of the gearbox it goes into the drive shaft and the drive shaft accelerates and decelerates four times per revolution and then when it goes back into the differential it smooths back out again if the if the fixed axes are not and that's what a cv joint is right a cv joint isn't a cv joint there's no such thing as constant velocity but instead of having four it's got it's got six or eight so the the variations are are very very um little uh, mm -hmm. as as it changes um changes accelerates and, and decelerates but they call it cv for constant velocity john uh, what you said is true for all drive shafts midget for example yes although you can't um midget a midget 1275 slips in and out of the back of the gearbox so you can't get those mixed up okay but, but the midget 1500 absolutely thank you Hmm. Okie doke. All right. Um, now we're going to go to um, Rich, who's got a question. One more question was ignition. My ignition key is now occasionally sparking when I turn it. Your ignition key. A big yeah. spark. Not static electricity. Definitely is short. What what year what year do you have, Rich? Uh, 1960. Say again. 1960. 60. How do you know that you can see the spark from behind the dash? Uh, in front of the dash. I've never. I... <laughs> okay. All right. This is good. I I've never heard of this. I, I. But but when you turn it and the sparks all, all all done, it doesn't continue to spark or melt anything. Nope. Everything's fine. It's it's very intermittent. Uh. Yeah. That's good. Oh my gosh, I'd love to see that. If you can do that and do and and get that to do it on your phone, um, I mean, okay. you know, have your phone going and turn it on and off and get the spark and have the have the ambient light down so far that I can see the spark. I would love to see that because I've never seen it before in my life. I can't even believe it's happening. Is it <laughs> a factory a factory ignition switch? Do you think? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It just started uh, about six months ago. Crazy. Crazy. You got it. I mean, so I, I think there's probably a short inside the like the barrel. Well, I, I guess, but yeah, but how? I mean, it's supposed to be isolated back in there. So and, and the fact that I mean if you turned it and then the whole thing turned red hot and melted your key and right. melted your dash and everything, I'd believe it, that. It's like but one in every three times. That is so right bizarre. On. Yeah, it's it's scary, but the car works completely fine. Barney's almost always on. Barney, are, are you on tonight? You still on? Barney's almost always on. Uh, Barney's advice on uh, MG experience was to take the ignition switch out and rebuild it. Yeah, you can do that. They're often riveted together, so you got to be really careful taking them apart. But sure, sure, that's it. And and it certainly would be better than a new one that's made in our favorite Asian country. Yeah, but still, I just wondered if, if Barney was on, um, but because he often has something to say about that. But oh my gosh, I'd love to see a video of that before you take it out and do anything. Okay, please send me a, a video on the phone. You, my my phone number's on on my website, I, and if I, you're going on my website, be sure to press that PayPal button. Thanks. Okay. All right. You got it. So here we got E H S iPad. So use the star washer to help contact. And this is from so long ago. This is about the about the MGB, the 68B, that you turn the ignition on and the headlights are low, low power, and the starter motor didn't work and everything. So EH's comment here is use a star washer um, to help to help um, make good contact. That's a um, electrical, yes. Um, actually, most of those that you see are external star washers. Um, so, thank you, Mr. E.H. 
So, um, oh my gosh, we're, we're at 915 and we still have more messages here. I, I can't, I just, we can't get to all of them. I'll, I'll do two more here. I apologize for, for uh, we're down to 89 people. I know we're up pretty high before. I think I saw 150 on there at one point. Um, I'll leave it to Doug to, to, to do the counting when he's on. Um, I changed my temperature sending unit. This is Charles uh, Bautieri. Uh, on my early 74B, the temp gauge constantly reads high. Yes, it does. Because guess why? The GTR 103s that are being sold are made wrong. That's just the way it is. So um, what can you do? Not much. Um, um, I talked to one guy before who said he put a resistor in line, a 30 ohm resistor, something like that, and brought it down to normal. But what that means is when it does get hot, when it does get hot, the needle isn't going to move much. And then, and then, then what do you do? If, yeah, if I actually, I actually put a 25 ohm okay. resistor in line, and it and it brought it down to you know I don't know seven eighths or something like that. So at least I have some. It's not pinned to the high. I have some some you know, movement, some movement. But it, I I kick myself because the original sensor that that I replaced. The only thing that was wrong with it is the the um, the terminal that was riveted onto it broke off. So, you know, I, I, I replaced it. I threw the other one away. Stupid you know, name. you know, the first rule of MG ownership is you never throw a part away. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe old brake pads. Okay. But yeah. Yeah. Well, no good deed goes unpunished. That's right. Um, um, well, would, you, would replacing it with one of the black ones? You know the black sensor would that would that change it? You know I don't. It's there's a. I mean what you got on the on the gate on the dash is a voltmeter, and what you've got in the in the um, engine is a variable resistance, and it's a five eighths uh, five eighths eighteen thread, so anything that'll fit in there. But um, you might contact the people that sold that unit to you, and ask because they know that there's a problem and see if they'll send you another one because usually <laughs> it just reads high. It doesn't, it doesn't peg. Usually it doesn't peg. Maybe the quality of the sending units is even worse now than it was. Yeah, actually, I, 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 they were really good about it. They did send me, a, they sent me a second sensor and I changed it out, same thing. And I, I say it's, it reads high. It's not necessarily peg, but it's certainly high. So if you use two sensors and ran them in, in parallel, what would happen then? I'm not enough, I can't, I can't do the, the calculations, but, um, I, and I just thought of that, um, like where would you put another sensor? Um, I, you know, I, I don't even know. Uh, so in, anyway, anyway, it's a problem. It's a problem that all of us have to suffer through for a while until, the sending units, I think in Glenn, uh, Glenn from Glenn's MG service, Glenn Lenhard called the place that made them, I think in Spain. And um, their first comment was, well, you don't buy these from us, so we don't have to listen to you. And he goes, well, okay, but you know, they're wrong. They're all wrong. And they said, well, we're making them to spec. They said, well, then the spec is wrong, you know, but it, it has to do with, a, with the temperature. So I, I don't I don't know a way out of it. Yeah. Well, it's certainly it. it's certainly a nuisance. Uh, at least the car is not overheating. You know, yes. So, yep. but, okay. Well, thank you. Hey. Good luck. Thanks. All right. So my my last one here. I, I just because it's uh, twenty minutes after nine, um, and I just got a note here on. Uh, here and I thought maybe something to do with the Zoom tonight. Um, uh, from 77 MGB, my 77 MGB after either hard acceleration or sustained high, oh wait, that's the, um, the vibration under the floor, excuse me, excuse me. Um, 
I'm going down here. Uh, PIB, I'll just mention that. That's the Portland International event. John Ranella has sent us a note about that. September 19 through 23, PIB, that's an event. Steve Olson, on my, on my midget, I fixed the steering column working under the dash. I drilled a hole through the outer column and into the inner, and I drove a plastic drywall anchor into that hole, and it eliminated the rotational slop. And I hope in an accident that the plastic anchor will shear. So Steve Olson did that. That's, that's um, I hadn't heard of that before, but that's, a, that's a, maybe a, a way to, to take care of that. For that problem. I, my guess is, I don't know how. Steve, are you still on or have you already left? Steve is not on because I, I wonder if he did that last week or last year. Makes a difference. I did that, I did that a couple of years ago. Oh, so it's lasted a long time. Yeah. Okay. All right. Hey, well, that, there, there we go. So that was a, a, a pilot that you had to drill, what, a quarter inch hole in there or something, rather. Yeah. Than, Okay, very cool, very cool, and it, it cut down that free play. What, what yes, a good yeah. idea. All right, all right. What what an interesting idea. Thank you. That's what I had handy. Yep. Well, and you know the danger of putting anything in there is that if like a bolt or or a pin is if it walks out, all of a sudden you're halfway through a turn and it catches in that in that metal framework, you know, and then what are you going to do? So this, the, the, the plastic you can steer through, I bet, <laughs> make it move. So yeah, that's a real good idea. Thanks, Steve. Thanks. Well, I've got a, I, it's a 9, 9.22, we're down to 75 people. So we saw 75 diehards here. Um, thanks everybody for coming on tonight. It's been a real John, rush. John, one, um, quick, one quick one before okay, you Okay, Guido. I put a new sending unit in, in the gas tank. Yeah. Okay. Filled up with gas. I go ride and ride and ride and ride. And it seems like it never moves. I go, man, I'm getting good gas mileage. Then I'll go park. And I'll get in the car, start it up. Now it's at three quarters. Is that characteristic? Is that the way it works? It's the same problem as those temperature sending units. They, they don't have the quality that the original ones had. If you still have your original sending unit, I can tell you how to fix it. But if you've discarded it, of course, that's, that's a done deal. Go on, go on. Yep, okay. Go on. But is that the way they work? No, no, they should work. They should work correctly. Yeah, so I'm stuck with this piece of crap. Yep. <laughs> yep. Uh, ben. I was going to say, was it the new style with the improved one, or was it an original? Well, Guido's got steel a, one? What, what, what year's your car, Guido? 72? 70. 70. 70. 70. 70. I, bought, I bought it from Moss. I yeah. put a new tank in. And it's just, uh, it's frustrating because, you know, you get in, you're driving, and like. Yeah, it's frustrating. Yeah, like the other I, day, I, I was like, it was at a half a tank. And I, I know I've been out a lot longer driving the last couple of weeks, and I'm going, you know, can it be? It's only six gallons of gas. I mean, it's a 12-gallon tank. It's the body I go to the gas, sta I go to the gas station. I fill it up, six gallons of gas it took. So it's it's accurate, but it's, it's sticky. it doesn't move like you would like to see it move, you know? Sticky, yeah. Sticky. And it's a metal one, right? Metal one. Yeah. Hi, this is Doug John. I would, I would say um, as long as the uh, trip meter works and the odometer, whenever I fill up with gas, I always reset it to zero. So I figured I can get, you know, 175 miles or 200 miles to a tank or something like that. So that, that's what I, I do that on all my cars. Uh, you know, you might be able, if you do a lot of highway driving, you might be able to go 250 miles on the mm -hmm. tank. Well, the, frust the frustrating thing, of course, is that you bought a new part and it 
you know, me out. It it should work, you know. So yes, but that's certainly there's a a way around that. I had a I had a gal. We put a new back in the day when you could get good quality sending units. They came with two spade terminals on them, um, one for ground and one for the the green with black wire, the sensing wire. And either I or one of my guys plugged plugged the green with, with uh, black into the wrong into the wrong spade and and it was showing full you know, if we went to um, anyway and the gal calls me up about a week and a half later just on fire because she's run out of gas <laughs> and I said well that was a week and a half ago she said, well, yeah, but you turned tuned my car up at the same time, and I just thought you did a really good tune-up. So it's like, <laughs> slap, slap. <laughs> I was like, no, I can't make a tune-up that good, you know. Can, can I ask, Guido, did you get a 16-gallon tank or the just standard? Standard. Okay, because I put the 16-gallon tank in my my sending unit. is It shows that I'm hardly using any gas for the first uh, quarter of a tank. And then all of a sudden it's because the sending unit is about in the same place on the tank and the 16 gallon is on the 14 gallon. So in the upper half of the tank, it's very inaccurate. And then it's, then it goes down pretty fast after the half tank mark. I even went to, I even went to go check the other day to make sure it's a line, right? Like it should be, you know, when, but it's all, it's all locked in where it should be. No, it's just, uh, it's just a faulty unit. That's all. I mean, it works, but it's just, uh, it's not as accurate as I would like to like to see it, you yeah. know. I would call Moss, maybe they'll send you another one. Yeah. But yeah. the same crap though. Could a voltage regulator do that? If it was a little um, faulty No. Temp? Well, it could, it could, but then your temp gauge would be reading, would be jammed all the way over on, on hot at the same time that the gas gauge was jammed on full. So, since Guido didn't say that, it is possible that, the, but the stabilizer, the voltage stabilizer um, operates both of those units. So if they're both acting in unison, like extremely low or extremely high, then oh yeah, sure, for sure. Uh, temperature, but, temperature, temperature gauge is working great. There was a lot of discussion on the uh, MG enthusiast site and you could search for it in the archives on a device that used that you use to calibrate the fuel gauge uh i don't i can't think right now what what its name is or something but you might search the archives for uh, uh i believe it was for an mgb um that uh you put in I, I think in series with the fuel gauge and these guys were saying that after fiddling with it they were able to get it to uh, be very precise. I, I've never used one myself, but those kind of thingamabobs do exist. There was a, there was a factory tool um, that Smith made to test the gauges and to test the sending units both. Um, I saw one for sale at the, at the Chicagoland swap meet about 10 years ago. The guy wanted I don't know, like 125 bucks for it. And I thought, well, that's too much. Well, of course, I didn't get it. And I wish I'd spent the <laughs> I wish I'd spent the money and money and bought it. Glenn has one uh, at Glenn's MG service. Uh, but you know, the the original um, the original sending units got this got this bar about that long. It's hard to gesture in this weeny little camera here. And uh, it's it's got oh I don't know how many windings it's got a jillion windings and and there's a little arm that sweeps up and down it's just a it's just a rheostat and you take one of the new ones apart and it's got fifty windings on it instead of mm -hmm. two hundred so that that's why it it gets caught and it it jumps around it just the quality just isn't there that's all. Mm -hmm. All right. Just the way it is. Yep. Well, anyway, ladies, gentlemen, um, everybody, it's it's been a real pleasure tonight. And I thank everybody for coming on. We still got 62 people on to listen to, to the very end and, and uh, say goodbye when when time comes. Ron Nugent, I see you on there. George, thanks for, for coming in. 
Doc Rosefear, I saw you come in about an hour early tonight. Must be you got the time confused. And uh, Crystal, thanks for being here. Judd, always, you know, and um, um, geez, Bill Waterstrat, I haven't talked to you for a while. Thank you for, for, for being here. And uh, Bobo Tanner, I see you're on. That's real nice. Bill Barge, you're always on, but you never say anything. Um, so anyway, thanks everybody for, for being here and, and I appreciate it. Uh, lots of fun and we'll look forward to doing our next one. Well, I don't have my calendar. Wait a minute, I got a calendar here. Uh, let's see, it's, not, it's probably not gonna be the fifth because that is Labor Day. And just a minute here, let me try again. And the 12th, I probably am not gonna do it on the 12th because that is, I'm going to be in Toronto on the 12th. So we're looking at the 19th probably, but I'll let everybody know a day before and you can come on in and, and, uh, and enjoy, enjoy all this. And again, if you want to go on YouTube, uh, you can catch the, catch the old ones, but it's like catching a game afterwards. It's not quite as exciting, you know, but we had a lot of, a lot of give and take tonight. That was very, very nice. Thank you everybody for, for coming in, Bob and Gloria, thanks very much uh, for coming in and, and offering uh, comments about your own experiences and so forth. It's really helpful. Doug, what, that, what, what, what was our count tonight, Doug? I, uh, I, sent, I sent a note over a little while ago. Uh, I counted 157. Okay, great. Thank you. Yep. Dan, yep. we're taking our B out west uh, at the end of the month after Altoona. I hope I don't have to ask, call you for tech advice. That's Where, where's out west? Well, we're going to, we're as after as Chicago, <laughs> we're getting on the um, Lincoln Highway. We're going to take that through Wyoming and uh, up into Yellowstone and down through, uh, through Utah and a few places to see there and down into Arizona, then New Mexico, and then we'll jump on Route 66 to come home. Oh, that's out west. Okay, that's cool. Mm. That's, we're 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 hoping we're uh, less than a hundred miles away from a half a million. Less than a hundred miles away from half a million miles. Yeah. We'll so have, when I see you in Altoona, you will have definitely. half a million miles on your odometer. Yeah. We, well, we're, original we're going, engine. Original engine. Original engine. Wow. Yeah. And we're we're probably going to go to Cumberland first. We got to check Gloria's uh, father's tombstone to make sure they got the date on it and all that and then we're going to go up to Altoona so we'll have well over half a million it, oh my gosh engine's only going to go around so many times <laughs> it's gone around <laughs> a lot so far yeah, yeah it is. oh my gosh oh my gosh wow but it's got a I, I my cylinder walls were tenting so it's bored out to 60 thousandths and got oversized valves a nice cam and the deck the the um Head's been shaved a little bit, and uh, it goes pretty good. So, so you've had some engine. So you've had some engine work done. Yeah. Well, the first time, I tore it down at 187,000 miles, and I, and I bought it at 40, and it already had been bored out 40,000. So it probably had 140, but I don't count that. And then we went through Death Valley, and I burned a hole in a piston. <laughs> then I did oh. a, a horrible thing. I bought cheap pistons to put in it. Well, that didn't work real long, so I, I got some decent pistons, but by that time, my cylinder walls were tenting, and so I had to have it bored out. And my final set of pistons, Hastings rings, and uh, I, 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 don't I don't scrimp on parts mm -hmm. anymore. And if, I, if I'm not uh, comfortable with the new parts, I always get used parts from Team Triumph, and they seem to, be, to work better, except mm -hmm. for the pistons had to be new, but... Yeah, it's and we're uh, we're confident. We I drive across country with it. <laughs> we're pretty confident about that. Hmm. Interesting. If you pull maintenance on your MG, it'll last a long time. And don't what, wait. What, what do you have? What do you have? Seventy four B. What's the What's the fastest you run that car? Well, uh, the year that there was no speed limit in Montana. I started passing 115 miles an hour and I thought I better slow down. It was still pulling. It was still, really? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Really? It, 
Yeah, that was fun. I'm telling you, it was, and, and the car was real comfortable. Everybody drove that year, 85 to 90, wherever you went. And the car you was- got o- You got overdrive? You got overdrive? Yeah. Oh yeah, I put overdrive yes. in when they, when they raised the speed limit back in whenever that was to 65, I thought I needed an overdrive, so. And I have cruise control because my, my right leg, when it turned 50, it started getting tired, so. <laughs> I, I know that control. really. I know that really. I drove to Alaska without cruise. It started to hurt. <laughs> John, it might my, my be with uh, my 70B. Uh, well, I heard it doing 70, 75. You can drive it all day at 75 miles an hour. I don't have overdrive. You can drive it all day at 75 miles an hour. Really? Yeah. It's a high speed engine. Since I got it, I've been afraid to go that fast. Well, if, if you have a, a non-overdrive, it's, I think, 21.9 or 22 miles an hour for every 1,000 RPM, according to the book. It likes to run, but I I, uh, I didn't want to – I got 70,000 on it, and I, it's original. It's and it runs like a bear, in. so. It's almost broke in. <laughs> So that reminds me, next time we'll talk about what to do at 100,000 miles on the engine <laughs> or around, around there to prolong to prolong engine life. One thing yeah. is to take a picture of your odometer. <laughs> well, anyway, cool. gentle, gentlemen, ladies, I've got to be on, on my way. And uh, th- thank you very kindly, everybody, for, for being on. And we'll look forward to the next time I can get on. Maybe I can get on in Canada. Um, And uh, anyway, we'll see. We'll see how it works out. So until then, safety fast. Drive your MGs. Join the clubs. Join the clubs and go to the shows. Marty, oh my gosh, you're still on. Oh my gosh. So, okay. Hey, thanks a lot, guys. See ya. Okay, good night, John. John, everybody. Thank you much. Good night, John. See you guys.